transformative change by 2030. I feel honored and privileged to welcome our revered chief guest amongst us, Dr. Kumrani Vritu Singh, founding chairperson Fiki Flow JNK and Ladakh chapter, most esteemed Dr. Renu Gupta, chairperson My Group of Institutions, Honorable Dr. Adit Gupta, Director Meyer and Principal Meyer College of Education, respected Mrs. Rupa Gupta, Joint Director Meyer and Director Srimati Shanti Gupta, Center for Women's Studies, Revered Mrs. Ruchika Gupta, Joint Director Meyer, esteemed members of Fiti Flow, keynote speakers who will be joining us online, Panelists, distinguished guests, dignitaries, Sri Pramod Kumar Srivastava, Principal, Model Academy, the faculty members and students of UG and PG Department of My College of Education. Thank you everyone for giving us your precious time. Now, a seasoned educationist and dynamic leader who has contributed a great deal to the quality of education through innovative and modern technologies to take the institution to the next level. He is imparting, impacting the lives of young minds with deep engagement levels, experiential learning and international exposure to national and international collaborations. He is none other than Dr. Adit Gupta, Director Meyer and Principal Meyer College of Education. I request, sir, to welcome the uh, August gathering with his warm words of welcome. Sir, please give a big round of applause. So, uh, very good morning to uh, all the esteemed guests present here. Uh, I deem it my uh, privilege uh, to welcome you all on the occasion of this seminar, uh, which is being organized on the theme Achieving Gender Equality for Transformative Change by 2030. Uh, first and foremost, I must compliment the Center for Women's Studies at Maya College of Education for taking this initiative and step uh, in organizing this uh, particular seminar on a pertinent theme. Uh, because as we all know that uh, throughout the country, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are a big uh, are getting a big impetus uh, in all the different areas and the SDG Goal Five, which is particularly catering to women empowerment and uh, you know providing the necessary educational uh, impetus for women education, uh, is taking a lot of steam. So uh, many congratulations on uh, you know um, organizing this particular seminar and choosing this particular theme. Um, I uh, am extremely delighted to welcome our esteemed chief guest, uh, Dr. Kumrani Ritu Singh Ji, uh, who's on her maiden visit to the Meyer College of Education. Uh, although you have been to our other institutions, but your visit here, uh, you know, gives us a lot of uh, happiness and encouragement that uh, women leaders like you who are really contributing to the empowerment of women in our society. And we see the lovely work being done by the Fiki Flow uh, in JNK uh, is uh, giving us a lot of hope and uh, belief that uh, uh, women leaders are the key, uh, you know, uh, persons who are uh, taking uh, uh, women education seriously. In fact, I've seen that you are going in different schools uh, in, uh, you know, rural areas of Jammu and you're uh, donating computers and setting up computer labs, uh, ensuring the technical aspect of education as well. So kudos to you, kudos to your work, kudos to your team. Uh, and I hope and believe that uh, you will continue to uh, provide your leadership uh, in future as well. Uh, so um, from all the wings of uh, Meyer as well as from Meyer College of Education, I welcome you uh, on this visit today. I would also like to welcome our esteemed chairperson who herself is a dynamic leader and under whose vision the Meyer Group of Institutions is growing leaps and bounds. Uh, and he, she herself is a spearhead of, uh, you know, uh, power. She's a powerhouse who's taking women education to the forefront. Uh, in fact, when we talk, talk about gender equality, I see there's a lot of gender inequality because less men in this room than uh, women. Uh, 
uh, but uh, you know uh, that's what the new world order looks like. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, um, it's great to see uh, you know her uh, role in uh, uh, spearheading the cause of women education uh, in our region. Uh, I would also like to welcome our esteemed joint director, Mrs. Rupa Gupta, who's the head of the Center for Women's Studies and under whose leadership this particular program and seminar is being organized. I'd like to welcome Mrs. Ruchika Gupta, who's the joint director of the Meyer Group and also uh, the treasurer of the Fiki Flow JNK chapter. Uh, I would uh, like to welcome all the esteemed members of the Fiki Flow. Uh, and as we all know that Fiki Flow is the women's uh, you know, wing uh, of the Federation of uh, Indian Commerce and Industries. Uh, and uh, they are doing a wonderful work uh, towards empowerment of women. And it is only because of their efforts we see a lot of change on ground uh, that is happening. So kudos to your organization and thank you all of thanks to all of you for coming today uh, to attend this seminar. Uh, I would also like to welcome uh, our esteemed uh, heads of the department, Dr. Mulraj and Dr. Ronika Sharma and deputy heads of the department, Dr. Nishtharana and Dr. Monika Bajaj, uh, who themselves are leaders in their own rights and uh, they are you know, always uh, spearheading the cause of quality education in our institution as well. Uh, I would also like to welcome the faculty members of Meyer College of Education and dear students uh, who are participating in this uh, inaugural program and in the other sessions uh, being organized in the college today. Um, as we all know that uh, the United Nations has set up this goal that SDG 5, which is the achieving uh, gender equality and women empowerment by 2030. So this goal cannot be singularly achieved by the government itself uh, unless and until the participation of all private organizations, especially educational institutions at the state, uh, the union territory and the national level happen. Uh, it can only happen through enlightened citizens and we can produce enlightened citizens only through sessions and seminars like this. Uh, where we have uh, organized. Uh, I am so happy and delighted to inform you that we have our inaugural keynote address uh, by none other than uh, Dr. Rekha Kohl, who's just joined us online uh, from Curtin University, Australia. Uh, she is one of the key leaders uh, who, uh, in the field of STEM education, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, who's really taking the cause of uh, you know women in science, women in engineering, uh, and women in technology. Uh, you know, in countries like Australia, and she has been a role model for our institution also and has been associated for over two decades uh, with our organization. So I'd like to personally welcome her uh, today in this uh, seminar as well. Uh, uh, so she would be, you know, speaking on a very uh, pertinent uh, topic, uh, which is uh, safe to speak uh, women empowerment and SDG 5. Uh, and in fact, uh, we had a project with her also um, for uh, equality in education, which, which was also under one of the SDG goals, uh, which was uh, conducted jointly by uh, the teacher training is uh, teacher trainees from Meyer College of Education and teacher trainees from Curtin University. Um, besides that, uh, we have a power packed uh, panel discussion uh, in which uh, we have uh, women leaders and uh, men leaders from different walks of life participating in the event today. Uh, followed by a keynote address from a uh, professor of uh, political science from Miranda House College later in the day. So this whole program has been uh, envisaged and, uh, you know, developed, uh, keeping in view uh, the goals and objectives that we need to achieve. And I'm sure that with all of your contribution, with the contribution of the Fiki Flow JNK chapter, uh, we, are, we would be able to achieve these uh, goals uh, in a very befitting manner. So um, I uh, congratulate you all once again for organizing this program and welcome you wholeheartedly to our campus and to our institution and hope we have uh, excellent deliberations today and uh, the interactions really lead to meaningful, uh, you know, goals and objectives being fulfilled. Thank you so much and welcome once again. Thank you, sir, for your warm words of welcome. Proceeding further, a role model, a dedicated leader, a woman of substance, someone we can look up to for support, guidance, and hand-holding, a mentor whose blessings we cherish every moment. She's most esteemed chairperson, my group of institutions, 
Dr. Reno Gupta. I would request ma'am to share her views and enlighten us about the seminar. Please give a big round of applause. Ma'am, please. So, Dr. Purani Ritu Singh, Founder Chairperson, Maharaja Hari Singh, Social and Education Foundation, Jammu, Trustee Rajput Charitable Trust, JNK, and Founding Chairperson, Piki Flo. JNK and Ladakh chapter, Dr. Rekha Call, Associate Professor, School of Education, Curtin University, Australia, and the keynote speaker for the inaugural session, Dr. Pushpa Singh, Associate Professor, Department of Political Science, Miranda House, University of Delhi, and the keynote speaker for the afternoon session, esteemed members of the Fiki Flow who have graced today's occasion and the faculty of might who have joined us together to celebrate this International Women's Day. Mrs. Rupa Gupta, Joint Director and Director, Center for Women Studies and panelists for today's seminar, Ms. Neha Bakshi, JKAS Undersecretary, Information Technology Department of uh, um, Government, Jammu, Mr. Basir Latifi, SSP Commandant, IRP, 15 Battalion, Jammu. They'll be joining us probably at the tea time, but I would like to welcome them and let you know who all our panelists are. And of course, we have Mrs. Ruchika Gupta. She's also one of the panelists. And we have Professor Sunita Zalpuri, Dean, Might School of Law, and all the HODs and faculty and my dear students. I think a very warm welcome to all of you and congratulations for the Women's Day to all of us. A word about the seminar. As Adidhi has already spoken about the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are also known as Global Goals, which were adopted by the United Nations in 2015. As a universal call, for action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that by 2030, all people enjoy peace and prosperity. Here I am reminded of the Indian concept of Vasudev Katumkam, which means one earth, one family, one future, denoting the whole world as one single family. And I think the pandemic showed us that it came across not to any country, but it came as a whole to the planet and that also brings us together. So probably sometimes adversities bring us together. So talking about the SDG goals, I think they place gender equality and empowerment of women and girls at the heart of its implementation with the promise to leave no one behind. It provides an unprecedented opportunity to transform the lives of women and girls and to catalyze progress towards sustainable development in all dimensions, whether it is economic, social or environmental. So in order to address the structural causes of gender-based discrimination and to support True transformation in gender relations. The UN Women proposed an integrated approach that addresses three critical target areas of gender equality, women's rights, and women empowerment. The first is the freedom from violence against women and girls. Concrete actions to eliminate the fear and experience of violence must be the centerpiece of any future framework. The second is gender equality in the distribution of capabilities. 
that is knowledge, good health, sexual and reproduction health, and reproductive rights of women and adults and girls, and access to resources and opportunities, including land, decent work, and equal pay to build women's economic and social security. And thirdly, which is most important is the gender equality in decision-making power in public and private institutions, in national parliaments and local councils, the media and civil society, in the management of governance of firms and in families and communities. So actually it starts with the family and communities. We have the decision-making power as to when do we want to be educated, what course we want to follow, whom we have a choice to get married to, when do we want to have children. So these are some of the basic you know, decision-making powers. If the basic decision-making powers are given to the women, and I'm sure they can do wonders, not only with their own lives, but in the life for the lives of others also. So in a way, I can say that in a nutshell, giving voice to the women to make them more visible, developed, productive and equal partners with men. So this call for this transformative framework, the theme of today's uh, you know, seminar is that we need to have sustainable efforts which are being done at the level of the UN, which should be adopted. And they were the ones who inserted this standalone goal of gender equality in all those sustainable development goals. So that this one goal could you know, get interconnected and the total development of the women can take place. In fact, the total development of both the genders could take place. Now, what is this SDG goal five, that is gender equality? It encompasses a multidiscipline approach with a wide range of targets that include ending discrimination and violence against women, including trafficking and sexual and other types of exploitation, ending child early and forced marriage, and female genital mutilation, recognizing unpaid care and domestic work, promoting women's participation and opportunities for leadership, ensuring universal access to sexual health and reproductive rights, enabling ownership of land and other property, including natural resources, and access to intermediate technology, which also happens to be the theme of this year's International Women Day, which we are celebrating. It says, Digit All, Innovation and Technology for Gender Equality. So the way forward is through a technology. This is one of the very critical aspects we want to grow and develop. Thus, the 17 goals are interconnected. I would just like to, you know, give you the, just the name, quick names of who, what are these 17, you know, SDGs. So number one is no poverty, two is zero hunger, three is good health and well-being, quality education, and fifth, of course, is gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry, innovation and infrastructure, then reduced Inequalities. So basically, when we are talking about gender equality, the goal number 10 is reduced inequalities. Then sustainable cities and communities, we are talking about smart cities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice and strong institutions and partnerships for goals. So these are some of the things which we can almost relate, you know, poverty, hunger, everything gets related to women. If her uh, family is poor, so how is she going to be empowered to take care of them? So all these things, they happen when these goals get connected. 
and of course <clears throat> i think these i would uh, you know try to summarize saying that gender equality is not only a fundamental human right but a necessary foundation for a peaceful prosperous and sustainable world there has been progress over the last decades but the world is not on track to achieve gender equality by 2030 why because the social and economic fallout from the covid-19 pandemic has made the situation even bleaker progress in many areas including time spent on unpaid care domestic work decision making regarding sexual and reproductive health and gender responsive budgeting is falling behind and of course last but not the least that we want that you should you know have your deliberations and i wish and pray that we have a very meaningful and fruitful deliberations and take away some of the learning uh, you know key areas learning uh, uh, things which we can take and carry forward to 365 days a week because i feel for a woman every day is a women's day so i think we should take it in our stride and get some learnings and try to do that in 365 days till we come back for another you know international women day celebration thank you so much thank you ma'am for throwing light on the theme of the seminar ma'am very comprehensively discussed about the sustainable developmental goals and uh, of course emphasized that women should have freedom from violence gender equality in distribution of capabilities and gender equality in decision making power these are the hallmarks in giving voice to the women and make them more visible developed productive and equal partners with men thank you ma'am now proceeding further i am pleased to introduce respected dr rekha kol associate professor in department head school of education curtin university perth australia dr kol has over 3 decades of teaching and research experience She sits on various advisory and editorial boards. Her expertise lies in the development, refinement and validation of questionnaires, investigations of the effects of classroom environments on students' outcomes, evaluation of educational programs, teacher action research aimed at improving their environments and evaluation of curriculum. Today ma'am has connected with us online for her inaugural keynote address on the theme safe to speak women empowerment and sustainable development goal 5 and enlighten us with her thoughts ma'am please good morning and good afternoon here in perth can you hear me can you hear me um can someone respond back can you hear me can you hear me can you hear me now can you hear me yes i can hear you clearly can you hear me yes, thank you yes ma'am thank you good good morning and good afternoon because uh, we are past midday here um and um, thank you first of all 
for inviting me to this very significant uh, moment, which is um, International Day of Women, and to speak on that. I really feel privileged today talking about this issue because this issue is very close to my heart. Uh, first of all, thank you to um, Dr. Renu Gupta ji, who is the beacon light here in Jammu, uh, which is my hometown, and she's giving a voice to women. Thank you, um, um, Kumari Rani Ritu Singh ji, for coming and finding time for this very important occasion and to all of my society or parivar, I should say. When I received this email from Renuji that uh, you could speak on this uh, day, and the first reaction from me was, and she wanted a topic from me, I said, safe to be silent. And two days later, I'm getting an email back are you talking about the women's empowerment? I said, yes, it is women empowerment. Why I said, I want to explain it to everyone here, why I said safe to be silent is my earliest memory as an Indian woman, as a Kashmiri woman, goes to my grandmother singing lullabies to me and telling me, Oh, my golden daughter, never get stories from your in-laws to my house. I don't know how many of you can understand Kashmiri there. It was Sonukuriya Yene Vanakwirvichkat. Then it comes to uh, my father who told me in our system, father is the head of the family then your husband will be the head of the family, and then it will be your son, which, which was told to me very early on, maybe around the age of five or six. But my father, who believed in the power of education, at the same time told me, hey, daughter, that, that could be true. But education is the way, and I would want you to be independent. Get educated. Education is not the content knowledge of the subjects which was given to or started in current India by Britishers, where we were, uh, you know, producing workers. And now that we go to 21st century learning skills. Again, we are giving skills to people. That's not education. Education is giving the right skills for the life, life skills. So what my grandmother taught me very early on is you will be safe if you are silent. But my father told me something which told me, yes, you got to be silent. But at the same time, there's something more than that which can give you voice. And this is what we are celebrating, giving ourselves that voice. Growing up a little bit older, I got married and I enter into my husband's wife. A wise lady there tells me, Silva, Silva is, an, is a noun for a name and says, Silver made a hearth of gold by keeping quiet. And Sparrow, Sparrow is also again a name for a second person, made noise and got eaten up. The message here is again, you're safe if you're silent. And if though these are the type of messages which are going on in our society, how are we going to achieve empowerment? And how uh, or how are we going to get gender parity? Um, Kashmir University recently in, uh, did a study three years back, which was, um, I saw the report, where 50% of women who are working women didn't have control over their finances. 
this is a concern. If it's happening in Kashmir, could it be happening in Jammu and could it be happening in the rest of India? I'm not sure. But we need to look into the issues. We are privileged. We are educated. We have a voice. But do we really have it? So where is the social system which is not giving us voice? And that needs to be started. Uh, and that voice needs to be escalated. And that's the only way we can get that parity. I don't see in any case by 2030, not only me, there are many, many scientists who see that by 2030, at least the SDG 5 is unachievable. So my I was thinking about these issues and thank you Renuji, Renu Gupta ji for inviting me and because your invitation got me thinking. It took me back to my age of three, five and 11, 20, around that. And yesterday morning, we were having a morning tea here in our university and I was asked to bring some cupcakes. And while I was baking them, and I thought we often overlook why do we celebrate this International Women's Day and where it originates from. And so I did some research and it corresponds to a protest in 1857. That's when we had the war of mutiny in India. And in New York, few textile workers who demanded a shorter workday and better wages because women always were paid lesser as compared to their male counterparts, which continues even today. Even in a university like Curtin University where the pay scales are dictated by the university policy, we still have 12% parity between the male and female wages. This is happening in university. What, what do we think of happening in rest of uh, developed country? We have, we do have gender gap, pay, pay gap here in India, uh, sorry, Australia. Um, but this struggle started in New York. And later on in 1908, needle workers in New, New York again marched and wanting a better pay, uh, uh, you know, labor market. They also demanded women's suffrage, which is their right to vote. And suffrage was, suffragette start, was first uh, responded to in New Zealand. New Zealand was the first country which allowed women to vote. Uh, India started in 47, I know very well, but it was much later. In doing so, they joined the universal suffrage, which started in New Zealand. The idea of an annual Women's Day was then taken up up by the Socialist Party of America. And at the 1910 International Socialist Women's Conference, American and Gen uh, sorry German delegates proposed a day. And this day still is celebrated, although celebrated worldwide, but there are questions asked, do we need, really need to celebrate it? And in certain countries, it is as uh, you ha it has uh, annual holiday. It's a uh, public holiday. And surprisingly, Afghanistan has this as a public holiday, while as women's rights, where women don't have any right to education. It is a public holiday. It's, it's, it's really uh, dichotomous uh, policies in countries. And we need to, as women, we need to raise voice and not to be look at ourselves as safe when we are silent. This year, United Nations theme for international is cracking the code, innovation for gender equal future. And technology is being seen as a, a, a 
called Tracker. But at the same time, yesterday, Com Commission for Status for Women, Chair Mathu Jyotni from South Africa said, although digital technologies are transforming societies, they are not, they are also giving rise to profound new challenges. Gender-based discrimination is a systematic problem that has been interwoven into the fabric of our political, social, and economic lives. And the technology sector is no different. So what do we do? So it's for these reasons that International Women's Day I support because it's connected to the grassroots social movement for emancipation, change and agency and to giving voice to those who may not have always have it. Importantly, it is about rights and struggle to realize them and a demand for a very least equality. I aim for equality. So how do we get it? Is we need to call for an action. We need to be philanthropic. Uh, Rekhaji, we can't hear you. There's a network issue. Can you wait for some time, please? Yeah, yeah. sure. Now we can hear you. Um, uh, yeah. Just a second, just a second. Mike. Please speak, ma'am. Ma'am, please speak. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, would you know where I stopped? Uh, you can start. You were talking about voting, voting rights. You were talking about voting, oh, voting rights. So, yes. Yeah. So, uh, let's. Uh, Move on from there. Yeah, voting rights uh, were given to women. The first country to give voting rights was New Zealand. Can you imagine a small country like that? And uh, in 1910, and somewhere again around the same time, American women and uh, German women together on their International Socialist Women Conference they decided that we should be celebrating uh, International Women's Day. And as you would know that this year's um, theme of International Women's Day is cracking the code, which is having more technology, giving women technology, uh, is getting that social, economic, and cultural uh, coherence for women. But at the same time, yesterday uh, in New York, while uh, the Commission for Status of Women, 67, its chair, uh, Mithu jo, jo Yini, who's a South African woman, she said that although dig digital technologies are transforming societies, mm -hmm. they are also giving rise to profound new challenges. Gender-based discrimination is systematic, systemic problem and that has been interwoven into the fabric of political, social and economic lives. And the technology sector is no different. That means even the technology, if we are trying to use technology to get that empowerment, it has to be handled with care to get that equity. It is for these reasons that I support that connected grassroots social movement for emancipation, change and agency, and to give voice to those who may not always have it. Because we were trained to keep quiet. A talking woman in presence of man was not considered to be good. Importantly, it's about rights and struggle to realize them and to demand for at the very least equality. I aim for equity, not equality. And 
how do we achieve it? Um, we can call for action. We can campaign for the action. We can have guidance from those who have achieved philanthropic. If we have money, use it for awareness raising and fundraising. We can collaborate, uh, collaborate between uh, the key partnerships. We can have shared missions and celebrate the achievement. That's very important. Uh, women's achievement should be celebrated and that will raise visibility amongst women. India has a lot to celebrate, right from the times of Rani Lakshmi Bai mm -hmm. to many, many role models like uh, Ahilya Bai Holkar, Sariyojni Naidu, Indira Gandhi, and we have a powerhouse of women sitting in the room and talking about what we can do. Uh, I talked to a few colleagues here who are women and they said, uh, right from India. And they, they said, aren't we empowered? Do we really need to celebrate uh, Women's uh, International Women's Day? I say, yes. There's no place for complacency. According to the World Economic Forum, sadly, none of us will see gender parity in our lifetime and not likely will many of our children. Gender parity won't be attained for well, well over a century. And uh, I, if I remember correctly, Seema Bahol, uh, again from UN, sometime very recently said, we won't get gender parity for next 300 years. So there is a lot of work for us to do. Empowerment is important. Raising awareness is important. And raising voice is important and there is urgent work to do, and there is for all of us to play our part in our own distinct ways. So let's get together and try to do our best to achieve that gender parity. Thank you. Um, Rupaji? Yes, Rekha. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would there be any questions from that end? Any questions from that? Yes. Any questions or queries? From the guests or the students? Yes, uh, hand mic, please. Sanjay, ma'am, ko de ji. Ma'am, he's just getting the mic. He's getting the mic. Am I audible to you, Rekha? Rekha, am I audible to you? Yeah, very much. Very much. Okay, good. So, first of all, I just wanted to say that uh, we're sending you loads of love from Jammu. Thank your you. Your homeland. And I'm delighted to hear you're from the region. So, we have to have you come back in person. It's lovely to see you online. But uh, I love the topic that you spoke on because it's absolutely imperative that we're not taught to be silent. No? Mm -hmm. Our biggest uh, you know, strength for women across regions, across uh, age groups, uh, you know, mm -hmm. urban, rural, mm -hmm. this is something that we've all been conditioned to do over the years, you know. You were so right. And this is something I think we can actually speak about even through our Kiki uh, Flow, Jammu Kashmir, Ladakh, and through our education uh, institutions, that we must change this. I mean, you know, we absolutely must. We do have the right to, for our voices to be heard. And often, you know, uh, I find that you've rightly said that, you know, be the voice for those who can't be heard. 
you know, it's extremely important. You know, it's it, it's almost, uh, I think each one of us have been conditioned so strongly as we are raised, you know, even by the most uh, forward-thinking families, there are certain expectations, like you said, you know, that uh, it's a given that the sun will become the natural heir, you know. And I think that's what is, uh, we need to change that, you know, to make uh, the parity completely, you know, relevant. We, we have to sort of bridge that gap completely and great takeaway from, uh, from your uh, topic, uh, I must say. Thank you for being on the session. It's been delightful having this interaction. Um, I've enjoyed it very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for such a, uh, you know, inspirational and such a uh, nice elaboration uh, of what ma'am has said. And... Uh, Is that one of the basic fundamental rights that have been abused? Right, right, ma'am. Uh, and uh, I am uh, very thankful to uh, Dr. Rekha Kaul for very elaborately relating your previous... Uh, your personal life experiences right from Kashmir till Australia and all the other countries giving examples and your own experiences from uh, the worldwide experiences and relating them with the theme and inspiring us all with your thoughts. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, now I request uh, Mrs. Rupa Gupta, Joint Director Meyer and Director Srimati Shanti Gupta Center for Women's Studies, Meyer College of Education, who ha as a director of the center has done tremendous work in the field of women's studies by organizing programs like uh, village adoption and working for river, uh, rural women, uh, women's benefit, by organizing functional and financial literacy programs and women-centric research projects with other colleges of different states. The center has also initiated and implemented recently launched Gender Champions Club under the aegis of UGC in which students, both boys and girls are trained to be gender champions and work for gender equality. I request ma'am to please introduce our most esteemed chief guest to the audience. Ma'am, please. Ladies and gentlemen, a very pleasant morning to all of you. First of all, happy Women's Day. Yesterday we had Holi. So I wish all of you, uh, your life should be as colorful as vibrant colors of the Holi. Thank you so much for joining us today. Very seldom in life, we come across people, individuals and women who personify both courage and unlimited potential. I consider it a fortunate stroke of serendipity that I had the privilege of making acquaintance with one such dynamic woman, Dr. Kuvrani Ritu Singhji. When we talk about history, I'm saying history, H-I-S-T-O-R-Y. Our history is not a story of men alone, but women also. It is her story as well. We must remember that. It is said that girls with dreams become women with vision. We must empower each other to carry out such vision because it isn't enough to simply talk about equality. We must believe in it. That's what Rituji stands for. A leader, philosopher, philanthropist, social reformer, and a strong businesswoman. Her business interest lies in hospitality, health, and organic and eco-friendly areas. She is a pioneer in education, passionate about reviving age-old traditions through art, music, yoga, food, culture, and is engaged with many charities. She is a spiritual seeker and has reformed the lives of underprivileged 
and armed forces through many outreach and innovative programs. Talking about her family, Ritu Singh Ji is the daughter of an, a daughter-in-law of the erstwhile royal family of JNK. She got married to Sri Ajash Shatru Singh, member of BJP, President Rajput Charitable Trust, and former cabinet minister, transport, tourism, sports, science, and technology in 1989. She hails from a family full of ethics and deep-rooted values. At home, she grew up learning values, the importance of simplicity, and the virtues of being a self-made person, compassionate, disciplined, and patriotic. She has two brothers who have carved a niche in their own spheres of life. All her ancestors have been very patriotic and connected to their Indian roots. As a child, she was strongly influenced by her parents and grandparents. Born to Srimati Rohini Kapoor and Sri Ashok Kapoor, her father's humility, hard work, self-respect, and unflinching loyalty in service to his country were reflected in almost every aspect of his being. Whereas her mother would selflessly, selflessly serve in the Delhi Blind School. This cemented her roots for doing selfless seva and service and learned to be compassionate, empathetic, and kind. Both her parents worked hard and would still take out time to do a lot of social work. There's a lot to learn from your parents and grandparents as well, ma'am. Coming to DPS family, a good strategist, globally traveled, a strong networker, and skilled at team building. Dr. Kovrani Ritu Singh Ji has spent more than two decades in education, plays a key role in the managing committee of DPS Jammu as a pro-vice chairperson and as a member trustee DPS Nagbani, DPS Katra, Rajput Charitable Trust, Maharaja Hari Singh Social and Education Foundation Jammu, and Ashok Kapoor Foundation Jammu. Man, before read, uh, before I was going through your uh, bio, you know your life history, I was, I did not know you know why uh, what importance this Ashok Kumar Foundation is for you. So thank you so much for sharing that also. She believes that every child has a right to be educated, and there should never be any disparity between class, color, or race. She maintains that children are the future and it is very important to take a responsibility to create a society that is responsible and kind. Around 1998, while the uh, state, uh, our state was recovering from the onslaught of militancy, there was a need for providing meaningful education to a large number of children of the JNK state, desirous of growing into educated and liberated human beings. Most of the schools were affiliated to the State Board of School Education and only few were associated with the CBSE. But there was a need for school education with a global touch and educational environment that was both healthy and conduce conducive to the holistic growth of the children. That's how the idea of setting up the chains of DPS schools in JNK under the aegis of the G DPS Society in New Delhi was conceived and later implemented successfully. Thus, private participation in education brought the JNK state on the map of global education and created a sort of revolution in the education sector of the state. She also established DPS school in Leh Ladakh in extremely challenging terrains and difficult situations. What defines her is her, is her sheer strength of character, discipline, brilliant innovative ideas, willingness to strive for perfection and enthusiastic nature. Prayas a koshish, a try. The school's outreach program has been one of her biggest initiatives, especially developed for children of slum areas, laborers, inmates of old age homes, orphanages, and local communities in and around Jammu. Other initiatives taken by her include the development of underprivileged children, girl child education, pension to war widows of army and defense personnel, extending financial help to orphan girls on their marriage and providing free health and medical checkup and services to the underprivileged and needy. A visionary par excellence, a beacon of hope and inspiration, a woman who, has, uh, who is exemplary of the proverb, action speaks louder than words, has given a shape to the entire scheme of things mentored by her. Her exemplary vision, hard work, dedication, patriotism, passion for life, belief in improving lives, seva for animals, orphans, and old age home is outstanding. 
On 24th of May 2020, Fiki Flo Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh was launched by her as the founding chairperson amid the COVID pandemic, which set the record for rendering much needed services for society during COVID times. Her women led team members of Fiki Flo, JNK and Ladakh with women uh, work women work with women at three levels grassroots middle and senior levels their core philosophy is power to empower by encouraging young women startups in uh, jammu kashmir and Ladakh and providing necessary hand holding to them under her dynamic leadership picky flow jammu kashmir and Ladakh chapter has done tremendous work for women entrepreneurs they have made an impression as the first women chamber of commerce and industry in the region and launched a few successful initiatives such as model villages, financial inclusion for uh, rural women, networking for women run businesses and startup, army wives enablement, uh, literacy for the girl child and uh, cancer uh, awareness camps and many other opening uh, like computer lab for rural girls in collaboration with the N with an NIT foundation of uh, at DPS Nagwini etc. Empowerment is an area very close to her heart and has led to employment generation and economic empowerment for more than 500 women employees working in the organizations pioneered by her. She has got the leadership strength to make the voice of underprivileged women heard and has the power to give wings to their aspirations. Her main endeavor is empowerment and upliftment of women. She is a recipient of several awards for her contribution to uh, society, education and women empowerment. She has been recently bestowed with the prestigious Nelson Mandela Peace Award and the degree of honorary doctor by Nelson Mandela Peace Academy and Hari Singh Award Foundation for serving the society and empowering the underprivileged women and children whom she wants to lead by example. Her motto in life is, I always want to be, wanted to be the voice of those who go unheard, the eyes for those who can't see and the ears for those who can't hear. My life's journey has been impacted by two mottos, never give in and service before self. Ma'am, being a daughter of a brave soldier myself, I fully reciprocate your emotions and believe in duty unto death. Ma'am, very humbly, I would like to say that after going through your life's journey, it has provided me with three meaningful key learnings, mm -hmm. which I would like to share with our young generation mm -hmm. and people sitting in our audience. First, never ever forget from where you come from, that is your roots. Second, wherever you go in life, any status you acquire, if you have the courage, zeal, focus and potential to change the things or situations around you, please do it. Accept the challenges and take the world in your stride. Be like a free bird that leaves the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. And third, service and savor for the underprivileged and your nation. You are an epitome of Nari with Shakti, who truly needs to be recognized for all your achievements being a trailblazer who has paid a path for women to fulfill their dreams. It is on, it is an honor to felicitate you with Nari Shakti Award. Ladies and gentlemen, I would request you to please give her a standing ovation. I would request our chairperson, Dr. Renu Gupta, director, Dr. Adit Gupta, joint director, Mrs. Ruchika Gupta, to kindly come forward and present the Nari Shakti Award to Ritu Singhji.
I'm also presenting you a book which is written on our founder. Wow, this is and uh, it's written by none other than our chairperson, former chairperson. Of course, I'll open it and sign it. Yes, so this is our chair. Thank you. 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 Th
Transformative change may be like an abstract concept. The new OECD guidelines, guidance can help development partners ensure that their policies and programs bring out lasting change when it comes to gender equality. There are four mutually sort of reinforcing ways in which all development organizations can tackle the root cause of gender inequalities and reshape unequal power relations. Practice what we preach. Organizational culture is the key. Development organizations need to look at their own systems before looking outward. They must put into practice what they preach, taking a holistic approach to gender mainstreaming, including with their own institutions. This, I think, is really quite the key, you know. Think of the language your organization uses, the norms and culture it upholds, the guidance set out tools and checklists for organizations to get a sense of their own culture and social norms concerning gender equality. This information can be used to do, draw a blueprint for making cultural shifts. Abhi uh, that you're coming up with a book, and I think that's very essential. Making a blueprint, and this is very, very important. Recognize that, second, recognize that all development activity has an impact on gender equality. All development cooperation programs inevitably have an impact on gender equality. A helpful tool when thinking about transformative change is the gender equality confinum. It helps assess the kind of impacts the program will have on the equality, ranging from negative to transformative. Of course, achieving transformative change is complex and highly context-specific gender equality cannot be achieved by just one project or program alone. They said at a minimum development partner should ensure that all their programs and gender sensitive, sensitive are not blind to gender inequalities. They should aim to need to meet the day-to-day -day practical needs of both women and men, making the outcomes more sustainable in the long run. The third, I'm just making very brief points because I, you know, I didn't want to take too much time and I wanted to make it as crisp as I could. So the third, I believe, is pay attention to the inequalities that intersect with gender. The term intersectionality was first coined by American civil rights advocate and professor Kendall e. Crenshaw as a means of looking at intersecting social identities such as race, sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, religion, disability, economic status, and how they relate to oppression and disadvantage. Many statistics demonstrate the scale of gender inequality, but hide the nuances and the complexities within and between the groups of people who identify as women. To achieve transformative change for gender equality, development policies and practice need to promote the rights and inclusion of all individuals. Number four, support grassroots and organization and feminist movements. Women's rights organizations and movements in partner countries are critical factors for addressing the structural drivers of gender inequality, yet receive only about 1% of the official development assistance, ODA, because they are well-rooted in their own communities. Their expertise in contextual, their act based on life, lived experience, and are the best position to deliver transformative and lasting change. Working with the grassroots organizations can also help to preemptively identify strategies to initiate, to uh, sorry, to mitigate risks of cultural or religious backlash against development programs that aim to promote the rights of women and girls. The OECD guidance on gender equality in development operation encourages critical reflection, questioning and challenging of gender norms. It challenges the, the distribution of resources and roles based on a person's gender. It aims for better, to foster an enabling policy and institutional frameworks for development partners and adequately protects girls' and women's rights, tackles the barriers they face, and meets the particular needs, their particular needs. It requires collaboration at all levels. Frankly, the key is collaboration. As individuals, as organizations, institutions, and societies to accelerate the change and tackle the root cause of gender equality. So basically, this is what I've summed up for, for the topic of today. And coming back to uh, two minutes of uh, personal, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of a personal uh, discussion I wanted to have about my own personal journey, most of which you have definitely, uh, I don't know how you've searched all this and researched all this. But when we talk about influences and, uh, you know, how your internal transformation happens, when we talk about 
gender inequality and things like that. Typically, as uh, you know, Professor just told us, uh, you know, from uh, Australia that, you know, it's it's amazing how we are all conditioned to believe, you know, that we are different and we are not supposed to say or do or behave in a certain way. I uh, had a very progressive father and everything in my life centered around that male force. Uh, you know, uh, he was, uh, there are a lot of influences that have shaped my life and made me who I am today. But one of the major ones was my father. And he, uh, like you say, you know, you practice before you preach. So it, it, the impact he had with that practice that he preached over the dining table, over our meals, on everyday life, really impacted the way my future was going to turn out to be. You know, he was born to a, a family of six boys, so it was a very patriarchal society. I was the first girl, my, his wife was the first woman, so to speak, in his life. And my mother came from an army background. My Nanaji served as India's third chief of army staff and governor to nine, nine times he was governor to different states. So he had the leadership qualities in him. My Nani was a fiercely uh, independent woman who did a lot back in the day for war widows. She's the one who started Iowa. So when it comes to uh, getting skill, a skill set to really lead or to do something in groups rather than individually, stems from there. Uh, Papa was somebody who taught me the basics in life, my value systems, you know. And he always told me to believe in myself. Never ever did he say, don't believe in yourself. Go ahead and do what you want, you know. And he put me into a co-ed school, Lawrence School Sanat. There the motto said, never give in. And I learned never to give in, no matter what the circumstance. And often I compare my life to that of a lotus. A lotus blossomed in muddy embryos. And that's exactly how my life journey has turned out to be. I try and make the most of the most difficult situations. And like you said, adversity sometimes actually brings you to sort of come out with something really positive. COVID taught us all that. There were great takeaways from COVID, I feel. And uh, so Papa taught me a value system and his life was based on three principles, Shabbat, Simran and Seva. He was self-made, incredible man, uh, terribly handsome, inside out. So he is with me everywhere. You know, they don't really leave you. It, I was impacted by his physical loss uh, for the first two, three years that uh, I dealt with that pain. But after that, I said that he's much larger than just that physical form that was guiding me. He's my guiding light, let me tell you all. So that's why I always say, let's not make differences between saying, you know, women, men. It's women and men. You know, we've got to close this gap, honestly speaking. I mean, uh, it's about time we realize we, are of, we belong to the land of Shiva and Shakti, which I've always said. So one is incomplete without the other. So let's not go into this whole women, li li you know, liberation movement. We need to become equal. And the minute we stop saying, you know, that we are different, uh, everyone will accept that. And I have to, you know, really give credit to those men who uh, stand behind women who want to be empowered and want to be equal. So we have to give those men the credit as well. You know, let's not take away from that. Uh, honestly. You know, it's a fact, you know, like even today, the book that you've given me is written, you know, by by a male, you know, uh, one of your the pioneers in your family. So let's not get into the space of arguing and, you know, trying to prove a point that we are better or we're worse. I don't think uh, either of that needs to be done. But uh, we do, uh, sorry to say, but here I will lean a little bit. Um, I'm not saying I'm doing any favoritism, but women have this great capacity to multitask. We are homemakers and we are running a profession at the same time. We're able to take a lot more emotionally than men are. So in that context, uh, women sort of overrule uh, the men in that context only. Physically, we are cut out differently. We are creators, you know, so uh, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for us. And maybe we wouldn't have been here without you guys either. So it's a process. Let's, let's accept that. Let's all ex be in acceptance of that basic fundamental right, you know. So that's one. The other is that I'd like to really thank, uh, you know, uh, actually my God and Goddess for giving me that guidance all through my life. Uh, I'm very grounded. I come from a family, I got married into a family that was extremely conservative. And uh, maybe my voice was silenced for too many years. I did whatever I had to from the background. Nobody really knew that I was, uh, you know, doing the things that I was. 
But in a way, I looked at those as Gupta Seva. It doesn't matter. If they weren't known about, uh, you know, 20 years ago, it doesn't make a difference. It didn't take away from the fact that I did establish Delhi Public School at the age of 21, back in the day, 30 years ago. Uh, Prayas is a project that's really close to my heart. Digital literacy is very close to my heart. Uh, the bridging gaps is something that I firmly believe in. Uh, you know, bridging gaps is not just between urban and rural spaces, but it's also between, like, say, the civilians and the services. We need to bridge gaps rather than create barriers. We need to actually bridge the gap and bring society, uh, you know, the inclusivity of society is a crusade I'm on. And uh, through Flo, uh, my lovely Flo family, again, uh, I formed Flo and I fought for Jammu. And uh, at the national forums, I used to attend Fiki Flo, uh, you know, events. I was not a member of Flo national either, but I attended a couple of events and I saw the only uh, state that was not on that map was Jammu and Kashmir. And somehow I was able to convince the national that we can do this in Jammu. I don't know what I was taking on at that time. I had no idea. I didn't know what the forum was all about. I joined Flo the same day as I formed the chapter. So I'm as new to Flo National as anybody else of my members are. We formed a lovely core team. And uh, under the tree at Harinivas, we started with just five or six, you know, friends ideating. And then we were able to take this uh, off the ground. And I have to personally thank uh, my core team, my executive committee members, my entire member group for uh, really believing in, in this, uh, the, you know, the movement of flow, which was all about power to empower, you know, and uh, I know that this is really going to be one of the finest uh, organizations in time to come. We are the largest in Southeast Asia, the only women's forum, uh, business forum, chamber of commerce in Southeast Asia. So I hope uh, we are all able to sustain uh, what it stands for. And we will. We have an eclectic, fantastic group of women. And, uh, you know, where Flo is concerned, I'm sure it's just going to go from, you know, from greater heights to even greater heights. And my motto there was, I created a tagline for the chapter when I first started it. Part of my vision document was where mountains meet the sky. So that's where really, uh, you know, we want to sort of continue that. And uh, the beautiful change is that we are transforming, uh, you know, the concept of holding on to a chair or to a position. We believe in change. We believe in, you know, passing the baton on. And it gives me great pride that, you know, somebody from my kind of family who are normally very egoistical, uh, it's very difficult for them to give up something. I said, let me make the changes here. Let me lead by example, right? That's when you say practice more of the preach comes into actual being. So I was the first one who said, in fact, the national team said, are you ready to take this on you? Because, you know, this is the journey of law. And I said, absolutely. If I'm going to step, step aside and show the whole world that, you know, it's all right. It's not about the chair. It's about the forum, you know. And that's the reason why I took it on. Everybody told me, are you serious? You want to take this on? I said, oh, yes, I do. Because if I, as somebody who people look up to and somebody who is going to be sort of responsible for influencing people, if I can do that, everybody else in this room should be able to give up, you know, things for the health and the sacred, you know, for the sanctity of something much bigger, for a higher purpose, you know. So honestly, uh, you know, in that state, your lovely students, you've got your lives up ahead of you. And with this in, in this institution, I'm sure you're going to just achieve and uh, you're, you've got a fantastic opportunity. Go ahead, make the most of the opportunities given to you. Things don't come back. Life is never about a U-turn. It's about moving forward. So let me just say that, you know, very, very big thank you uh, to you, uh, Dr. Renan Gupta ji, uh, to the wonderful family, Adit. Uh, your, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I have to wear my glasses again. <laughs> I've got the list there, if you can just file. Yeah, sorry. I, I'm normally very extempo, so when I have to read, this is the only time I fumble. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, let me take it in the right order. Dr. Renu Gupta ji, chairperson of the Maya Group of Institution. Uh, Dr. Adit Gupta, principal Maya College of Education. Dr. Rekha Paul, associate professor and deputy head school of education, Curtin University, Curtin University Australia. Mrs. Rupa Gupta, my lovely Ruchika, uh, my family Ruchika. Uh, Dr. Bharti Tandon. And everybody, the entire faculty team of my, I thank
thank you with the bottom of my heart. I'm hugely humbled and I'm extremely grateful for this honor. It's going to save me forever. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your words of wisdom. A very inspirational speech you gave. And ma'am, lot many takeaways for our students, faculty, and of course, the dignitaries and the guests sitting here. Your experiences from your childhood, your family, your professional life, and the social work in tremendous capacities that you have done and established the union territory of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh on the national and the international front. It's incredible, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. And we are really looking forward uh, to be with you uh, in near future. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now I request uh, Dr. Bharti Tandon, being the convener of uh, Srimati Shanti Gupta Center for Women's Studies, my College of Education, who has been working shoulder to shoulder with our young director, Mrs. Rupa Gupta, and making a difference in lives of young women and girls, not only urban, but rural areas as well. Ma'am, you are requested to kindly come forward for the formal vote of thanks. Thank you, Komal Ma'am. A uh, very good morning. Um, I must say, uh, Ma'am, we are so inspired by your journey that I'm still, you know, kind of like thinking about it. And it's so hard to come back to my duty and, you know, propose a formal word of thanks. It's still going in my mind. So on behalf of Shilmati Shanti Gupta Center for Women's Study, I, Dr. Bharti Tandon, convener, deem it my proud privilege to, uh, to propose a formal word of thanks. My most sincere thanks go to Kubrani Dr. Ritu Singh Ji, uh, founding chairperson Piki Flo, JNK and the Dark Chapter, who despite of her busy schedule, graciously accepted our invitation and honored us to be the chief guest uh, in this particular session. Um, we are very much honored, ma'am. I extend my thanks to Dr. Renu Gupta, Chairperson Meyer, and Patron Center for Women's Studies, who is a strong proponent of gender parity and believes in the philosophy of hand-holding by providing equal opportunities to grow uh, both professionally and uh, individually. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Professor Adit Gupta, Director and Principal, my College of Education, for his steadfast support and being inspiration behind this particular program. He's a strong advocate of gender equality and gender mainstreaming. Being the captain of the ship, he stirs each and every one of us in the right direction. I extend my thanks to Mrs. Rupa Gupta, Joint Director Meyer, and Director Center for Women's Studies, who not only supports gender equality and women empowerment, but is also dynamically involved and engaged in community outreach services for making difference in the lives of many. I thank Mrs. Ruchika Gupta, John Director Meyer, Fiki Flow members, dignitaries, guests for accepting the invitation and gracing the occasion. My sincere thanks go to Dr. Rekha Cole, uh, inaugural keynote speaker, for candidly sharing her experiences about women's rights and struggles. My thanks go to uh, HODs and, and Deputy HODs UG and PG Department for uh, supporting and collaborating uh, with the center on this particular event. Uh, my thanks are also due to uh, um, IQAC team, venue arrangement team, media and publication team, technology team, hospitality team, gender champions, and also club members for making this event a great success. My thanks are... My thanks are due to uh, Mrs. Komal Sharma, Assistant Professor Maya College for ably conducting the program, faculty members and student present in the hall. Last but not the least, uh, all those who have worked directly and indirectly in making this uh, event a great success. Thank you all once again. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bharti ma'am. Uh, now I request the August gathering, especially the chief guest and the members of uh, Fiki Flow and the dignitaries here to kindly proceed towards the lawn for a cup of tea.
The time has been this time. Yeah, so I would think 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Another uh, 15 minutes. Sir, what's the time? I have mobile. Nahi rakha hua. Time kya hoga? 11.45. Okay. So we'll be joining back again in ele at 11.45 probably, sir. I am not keeping my mobile with me. 12.10? 12.10. So we'll be joining back at 12.10. So I request all the dignitaries and... Uh, the guests and the students to join back at 12.10 for the further proceedings. A very good afternoon, and I welcome all the panelists uh, for the panel discussion on the topic uh, Achieving Gender Equality for Transformative Change by 2030. 
um, you know, uh, the key words here in the topic are gender equality and transformative change. And there's a lot of buzz about the gender equality. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussions. There's a lot of discussions and, uh, you know, deliberations on gender equality. Uh, it has been the theme for uh, International Women's Day last year. So we uh, actually wanted to take a relook and see uh, how far we have come uh, from a development perspective. So my first question to all the panelists, uh, and which would become your opening statement also for the discussion, is uh, what do you understand by gender equality in the present day context? And we can start with uh, Salvador Imam with you. Thank you, ma'am. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a proud privilege to be one of the panelists uh, on a topic and theme which is very, very close to my heart. Because when we talk of gender, uh, gender instantly means that, yes, we are living in times where uh, there is predominant he and she um, you know, syndrome in our society. And when we say he and she syndrome, I mean to say that today's topic, relevance that gender equalities is one of the ways how to bridge this gap between he and she. When we talk of the he and she syndrome, it's not only he and she syndrome, it's also the power relations. It's also the dependency syndrome. And the most important uh, point when we talk of gender equality, when we talk of these programs, uh, which I'll talk, later on, but one important thing is that when we talk of gender equality, it means gender parity for all the sexes, male, female, and all other sexes. So that means in a layman language, we can say, it's not putting men behind. It's not talking only about girls, women, but unfortunately, it's a global phenomenon that women have been relegated to the background from time immemorial as has been mentioned by earlier speakers, right from Ranuji, Rekhaji, and uh, ma'am, uh, chief guest ma'am. Because we are living where, you know, this uh, dependency syndrome, the subservient uh, thing happens right from our childhood. And in fact, when we talk of gender equality, gender justice starts from the home. And um, um, I would just like to tell to the August gathering here, Yes, one of the statements of my father, long back when I was, you know, seven, eight years old, um, and uh, I could see that my mother was having special corner and feelings for my brother, and uh, she would do best of the best things to my brother, only brother, and we have three sisters. And once she said to my father, please don't make my daughters argumentative, they have to go to some other place. We're living in society where daughters ultimately have to go to some other place after marriage. So don't make them arguments. And I remember that vividly that statement of my father wherein he said, she's not my daughter only. She's just like it's to So, so being a very, very gendered statement. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. It uh, gave that spark to me that yes, I have to prove to my parents, I have to be like my son, you know, special. I have to perform something which should be above yeah. women. So that kind of socialization, we can understand that we have traveled in the last 25 years when we talk of, we have reached the sustainable development goals right from the Beijing platform. Not many things have happened by way of gender equality. We have bridged many gaps, be it literacy, be it education, be it uh, health or other things. But then still the 50% of women are unequal and to a greater extent that we're looking forward to the sustainable development goals, which will ultimately result in ensuring gender equality in the real sense. That means parity between all the sectors. Same power relations. Thank, thank you so much, ma'am. And uh... Very well for like he or she syndrome or uh, dependency syndrome. I would like to ask Arya, ma'am, what do you uh, you know believe in this or what do you feel about this? Good afternoon, everyone. First and foremost, I'd like to express my gratitude to this office uh, institution which has invited me here. Now coming to the topic, 
See, gender uh, disparity is something each one of us sitting in this room has faced somewhere or the other. Let's admit that. I mean, let's come out of the bookish uh, stories and be very, you know, like uh, within the margins and claim that, no, no, I am from a very forward family. I have never faced it. Me and my brother have always been treated that far, though I am, I think I'm privileged enough that I can't be treated that far with my brother. But still, like Ma'am said, somewhere a distinction is drawn, like if you have a small brother at home and he cries, he'll come, if somebody will come and tell him, please don't cry like girls. Yeah. It's crying particularly to girls. And why are girls starting with tears? It is okay to cry. So gender equality uh, to me is uh, having equal access to all the choices, resources, responsibilities, powers, values, to irrespective of your sex, be it a woman, a man, a transgender, a boy, a girl, everyone should have equal access to that. I think it is a, uh, if you deny a female, let's say a woman or a girl, if you deny them certain privileges or certain rights or say duties, you are denying half the world's population the access to those resources. We are a major chunk of the population on the earth. We are not just, you know, a negligible amount which can be ignored. I think uh, when you talk about a nation's progress, women are an equal contributor. There are a lot of things that women do which are not, you know, taken into account. Empowering women, I think, is recognizing, redistributing the unpaid work that women are doing in all spheres of life, irrespective of expecting anything in return. We have our mothers at home. Okay, let's see, very simple examples. Our mothers are work, get up early in the morning at 6, work till 12 at midnight. Nobody comes and recognizes them, but expectations are passed on them. She is expected to be at home when you, me, or a brother, or father, or husband comes back home. A female has to be at the door to receive. Why so? Why could a female coming back from an office expect his husband or his brother or his father to be there waiting for him? Because we have been conditioned in such a society where it is expected of a female to be, you know, to, uh, to have that kind of behavior. That I think uh, gender disparity is more of a societal issue. It's not an issue of the sex, it is more specifically a societal issue. It has to be, we cannot just relatively focus on women to resolve this issue. It is an issue concerning both men and women. The theme for today's uh, conference has, has been the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals set up by UN uh, regarding digital. We all are aware of that. It has been laying emphasis on, you know, um, use of innovative technology towards empowering women. What do we mean by that? These are very, you know, uh, kind of, you know, lucrative terms to express or put them into writing, innovative technologies for achieving gender, to achieve gender equality. Putting it in simple terms, it is an access to digital literacy. Rural urban, civilized, uncivilized. All women should be given access to digital for forms of literacy. We, I think we shall be elaborating that later during the course of the discussion. Yes. Uh, I'll pass it on to ma'am. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, thank you ma'am. Uh, talking about giving equal choices and opportunities, uh, I would like Puchika ma'am to share her thoughts on that. Thank you so much ma'am. Uh, gratitude uh, to all of you. Uh, and uh, to Maya, you know, giving me this opportunity to come here and be part of this panel discussion. And happy Women's Day to all the empowered women here and, and future women whom I see would be entering the workforce and carving their own destinies. So, uh, happy Women's Day. I don't think so. It's, it's a concept that needs to be celebrated only for a day. It should be every day. And this is not something we should see anybody else celebrating for us. I think the real empowerment starts from within. You need to be special. You need to feel good about yourself and you need to feel empowered yourself. Only then we can expect this change in the world around us. So having said this, uh, gender equality, I don't, uh, per se in the present day scenario, I don't see it so much as a challenge as equality. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, most of the women sitting here today don't feel equal to men. I'm sure they do. Uh, you know, they will have any less uh, uh, areas to perform in. Absolutely not. So I think in today's time, uh, equality is more in terms of opportunities and your capabilities. You know, the, the uh, voices need to be raised around these two areas. And I think opportunities are there, but what really holds ourselves back is our own mindset. So I can't stress enough here that what really needs to change is our own mindset. 
about how we see ourselves in this society rather than giving into you know how men perceive us you know it's, it's been over the years no point dwelling into yes challenges are there but uh, we can still sit back and dwell upon the challenges of the past how it all started how we have been you know subjugated to unfair practices but i think the the uh, thing to be seen now is the road ahead and uh, in today's time when india is progressing we are the fifth largest economy aspiring to be the third largest economy so i think in uh, women being the 50% workforce have a very very substantial role to play and uh, uh, this growth can will not be possible without women at all and when we talk about this progressive mindset as ma'am pointed out it needs to start from the home actually where where the mother you know needs to inculcate that aspiration into a girl child and say it's absolutely okay you know you should dream big you should go pursue your dreams and then i don't think so um, you know any of us present here can be held up if we have the right positive mindset to achieve what we have to achieve you know and to achieve what is even more important is developing the right competencies within us if we are skilled we have the right skill sets i don't think so any organization with having the right skill sets in a women would not you know promote that women or wouldn't want that women to be in a leadership role absolutely not i don't think so you know so we as women need to invest in ourselves uh, so it's such a everything is not very gloomy and negative i i i like to see the positive side of it you know our, our president is a woman today yes. so many nations have uh, their women. prime minister as women take norway take denmark uh, you know bangladesh and and uh, you will be surprised to know that the uh, happiness index of these nations is way higher so just because a woman is heading the nation you know than the other nations So this is this is a genuine study that has been carried out. So nations need women leaders. Gender equality is as important for women, you know, in nations. And uh, their happiness index and their where gender parity is greater is is very high on the scale itself. And uh, you know, there is a famous quote by a Brazilian author Paulo Coelho that when you uh, really want to achieve something, the whole universe kind of conspires and helps you to achieve. So, अगर आप कुछ शिद्दत से वाकई में ही कुछ चाहते हैं तो मुझे नहीं लगता दुनिया की कोई भी ताकत आपको रोक सकती है यू जस्ट हैव टू हैव दैट बिलीफ इन योर सेल्फ um talking about the mindset then we talked about capacities and raising the voice um so you have heard uh, you know three different viewpoints i would like you to share what do you think about gender equality thank you ma'am i will be sharing some personal experiences and experiences that my professional place i am heading a woman battalion exclusively women battalion for the last 3 years okay. so i have practically seen what it means to be a woman first of all gender justice is a very far cry we will talk of gender equality it is a myth whether it starts from home it starts from your workplace it starts from your school why should your father say she is like my son what is so special about being the son a girl in terms of her physicality in terms of sacrifice biology she suffers more she suffers more pain mentally physically biologically but still we want that she should be uh, like my son and expectations are more than it comes to contribution either in the kitchen or maintaining the household affairs so just to share uh, my personal experience in spite of being uh, very so called from an educational background from a progressive family and all that I start my day at five thirty. At six thirty, I am in the golf course. I play golf for two hours or three hours. Then attend office for six seven hours. In the evening, go to gym, and then I expect my wife uh, will serve dinner to me, and then just go to sleep. Whereas my my wife, she is also working woman, a professor in Western University, Jammu, and uh, 
she will get at 5 30, probably the whole prepare a lecture. Get um, ask our son to prepare breakfast for him, send him to school, then she will go to the university and she will before me and she is supposed to attend my parents. Maximum she can call a telephonic call to uh, her, her parents. And probably she's the last one to go to bed. These sustainable goals by defined by UN way back in 2015, we are already in 2023. Probably very few people know what, what are those goals. I'm not talking of uh, the big institutions or the women who have achieved big in life, be it the New Zealand Prime Minister or the Bangladesh Prime Minister. Practically, how do we behave in the society? Practically, how we behave in our home? And when you see the happiness index is uh, quite high uh, in those countries, uh, there is a beautiful auto couplet. I will be sharing uh, some details later on that how a woman contributes towards her family, towards her job, towards her society uh, later on. Uh, but when it comes to happiness index, Munir Nyadi has said, Shahar ka tabdeel hona, shaad rehna aur udaas, ronke yahaan jitni bhi hai aur toh ke dham se hai. So, how these happiness translates into our lives, if you will just make an impartial assessment, just look at your own home, what these boys hope you will not turn uh, against me at the end of this discussion. But this is a fact. Bahri ehsaan karta hai jaysay wo dunya mein aaya hai pada ho ki. Apne maabab pe ehsaan karta hai ki wo ladka hai. Or ladki ko hamesha hum us bechari or pada nahi ki ki naam usse ko. Mein abla nari to nahi ko hoga lekin uske naam se kuka. For the last three years, I have been trying to tell all uh, around 972 women constables and officers that they don't want to do it. 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 They don't Thank you so much, sir. And uh, I think you would be covered uh, some at all about gender equality. Um, I think every panelist did touch about there are issues, there are problems. So my next uh, question is, if we are talking about gender equality, we are saying it's a fundamental right, then why haven't we achieved it? What are the struggles? What are the challenges? Why we are still, you know, walking that road where we should have achieved that gender equality? So I could start with you, Naomi. Uh, see, for achieving gender equality, the issues are not something which we are not aware of. Mm -hmm. They are very generalized, aware, they are part of the society. One is the cultural issue. Everybody knows there is a cultural barrier in everybody's mindset. Uh, we have, as I said earlier, we have been conditioned in a manner to differentiate between a man and a woman, a boy and a girl. Taking, uh, just talking uh, off the record, because spiritually we were told that Atma is the truth. But nobody said that Atma is a man or Atma is a woman. Mm -hmm. It was just soul. Nobody had differentiated the sex of the soul. It was just supposed to be soul. Similarly, uh, but when the society was framed, I do not know if it suited the circumstances at that time or what I was not there. We were, all of, none of us were there at that time. It was segregated. The society was segregated into male and female. That thought, thought process has continued even till now. We are in 2023, but that thought process is still there. First, will definitely be the cultural aspect. Second, there are economic barriers also. Women today are not, I'm not talking about every female, but majority of the women today are not financially independent. They are still dependent upon their families, husbands, brothers, fathers. And so there is a, they cannot actively participate in decision making. They cannot own their life. They cannot determine the, where their life is going to turn out to be because they are dependent. Then there are workplace barriers also. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we, can, we can have others who you can talk about what are the challenges. Sorry for cutting you off. Don't wish to Okay. Um, as rightly pointed out by Nehaji, that yes, there are many challenges. Um, uh, cultural, social, 
right from, uh, you know, uh, uh, when we talk of, uh, from society, where we live, right, rightly pointed out by Sir also, uh, you know, when we talk of this uh, whole issues, it's not that nothing has been done. Good many steps, good policies have been formulated. You know, at present juncture, we'll be surprised, you know, number of interventions have been done by the government. Um, and uh, just to quote you, you know, um, we are talking nowadays of mainstreaming all these differences. Um, but the question is, suppose um, taking what Sir said, a government ko two minutes me ghar me ghar se nikal diya jata. Lekin jab government ko ghar se nikal diya jata hai, kya wo ghar ghar rehta hai? And that intervention was very done. You know, domestic violence, the residential rights have been ensured for women. But unfortunately, again, because of the socialization, because of the, the social taboos and things, nobody comes forward. How many of us go and speak regardless under that domestic violence? Challenges are there. And these critical issues for the concern were just highlighted long back in Beijing platform. And then we see so many uh, MDGs, SDGs, and whatnot. But the question is, how can we change? Because I told you, deal with them. But it's not, uh, it's very slow. It's not in tune with the requirements. And that's why uh, there's a good number of interventions taken by the government. We are nowadays talking of gender mainstream. We are talking of gender budgeting, gender response to budgets, policy frameworks, a number of things. But unfortunately, you'd be surprised to you know it's the recent, uh, uh, you know, statistics that we are 123 years uh, behind. So you can very well imagine because of the COVID, it got accelerated. We have reached the 100th position, but again, it will take us another 123 years to bridge the gap. So now, how to accelerate? We'll come, we'll come to that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Oh, what, what is your take uh, on the challenges? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, see, challenges are many. They will always be, you know, uh, this is a very uh, complex uh, circumstances we are in where, where we can list a number of challenges and we still stuck in that room. Uh, again, I can't uh, hard less on this fact that, uh, you know, the biggest challenge I see as women are that we are relying or seeking too much of external support for this you know uh what we really need to understand if we look at any organizations uh you know any country to develop any organization to grow um any any group to come forward i think what really needs to be worked upon is to work on your own core you know even if i work about talk about an organization if we don't work on the core of that nation core of the country core of the organization no big changes can be brought about so again, for women, I feel we need to strengthen our goal and we cannot keep seeking the support from outside. You know, if we talk about the India model, we see Gujarat as, as one of the main industrial hubs. Uh, Gujaratis have a great business mindset, they have accomplished that. If we look at Bangalore, which is the IT hub, they have been open to the external pool of talent and that's why they have accomplished that. So we, this is the enterprise of the people. It's your intrinsic spirit that needs to be developed. And then I don't think so any challenge will be that big a challenge that it cannot be overcome. So I, I like to take it as a growth mindset. You know, we have to develop a growth mindset where, you know, about quickly I'll just touch upon two, three key areas, which is, uh, you know, everything is possible. You have to tell yourself everything is possible. There is 100% accountability to what you are doing. You know, you have to, uh, we all have to believe that we are connected as women and we have to support each other and help each other grow. And attitude of gratitude and, you know, live to our full potential. So that growth mindset is really important. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so you have heard about there are challenges and how can we overcome those challenges? Since you have been uh, working with women battalion, so what challenges do you see and what uh, suggestions would you give? You see, we expect that the interventions have to be at the political, social, and economic level. But unfortunately, at all these three levels, there is in when we talk of political level, there is more politics than the political level. 
you then this woman becomes an object of probably a ridicule. You talk of Iran, somebody is talking of hijab in Iran because they are not wearing it, and somebody is talking of hijab in Karnataka because they are wearing it. So you are uh, you are making these women target instead of critical and intervention to empower them. Politics is being uh, played on them. Then when we talk on economics, how many people believe that the laws of inheritance, be the Muslim law, my professor Zinit Sunita Zalpuri is a law professor, that uh, there is a share in the property for a woman under Muslim law. And now Supreme Court has pronounced that even under Hindu law, she has got a share. How many of us actually contribute the property and give property to our daughters? And then a very big excuse is that we have so much money to pay for her marriage. We have so much money to pay for her marriage. So at the societal level, we have to talk about the marriage that you are a son, you are a son, you are a son, you are a son. How much property we actually act of the laws, we believe in scripture, we believe in religious laws, बाकी सब पे फॉलो करेंगे और अपने आप को बहुत रिलिजियस बताएंगे लेकिन जब बेटी को जायदाद देने की बात होगी उससे कोई बात नहीं होगी एंड दिस इज़ द एक्टिवोनिक अंतर्कार्य एंड द सोशल आस्पेक्ट तीस बारी साल तक एक लड़की अपने घर में माँबाप के साथ होती है एक बेडरूम होता है एक वॉशरूम होता है � ये लड़के जो जितने बैठे हैं कभी ये सोचिए कि अगर आपको ये कहा जाता है अपने भाई के साथ रोम शेयर करो तो कितना मुश्किल होता है और फिर उस माँबाप को कहीं अंकल और आंटी कहे तो उसमें भी ऑब्जेक्शन होती है मम्मी और पापा ही बोलना है उनके साथ जूती मुस्कर हाथे का फेरनी है उनके आंसुओं में आंसुओं में लाना है मैं औरत की कसरत बयान करता हूँ रंगों और फिटों की एक शायरा पर भी शाकर है। That sums up the nature of the woman. In one stanza she says, वो it is like this कैसे कह दो कि मुझे छोड़ दिया उस बात तो सच है मगर बात है रुस्माई की she has abandoned her. वो बोलना चाहती है लेकिन बदनामी हो, रुसवाई हो, इसलिए वो फिर भी नहीं बोलना चाहती। And in the second stanza, उसकी नेचर जो है उसके खबीर पे जो वो बोलती है, वो कहीं भी गया लौटा तो मेरे पास आया। बस यही बात अच्छी है मेरे हर जाएगी। She forgets everything, she forgets him, और हर रूप में प्यार देती है और प्यार देती है। चाहे माँ का रूप हो, बहन का रूप हो, बेटी का रूप हो, हमें नहीं समझ पाते। आपने उमन बताने की बात की, मैं आपको इनकी स्ट्रगल बताता हूँ। Most of the women who have been recruited in IRP 15 and the women battalion are either from the poor background or from the very lower middle class. All of a sudden, they get a salary of twenty or thirty thousand rupees. Since they are from the rural background, the first thing which comes in their mind, they construct a small washroom because in most of the rural uh, households, you don't have a washroom. They go in the open, this total sanitation campaign is very good uh, on the robot process, but you actually know open defecation and everything which it happened. Uh, so they construct a washroom or a small home. By the time she constructs it, she already spends two, three lakh rupees and she uh, wants to save money for her marriage. शादी हो जाती है तो ससुराल में जाती है तो जिसके साथ शादी होती है पहले तो पुलिस वाली के साथ कोई शादी नहीं करना चाहता दी यार सोशल टैब नहीं यार पुलिस वाली है यहाँ पे भी थाने जाती चलाएगी वो चलाएगी पुलिस वाली लेकिन जब शादी हो जाती है देर आर लॉट ऑफ एक्सपेक्टेशंस ऑफ काम हर इंडिया वांट he wants to send, send them to a good school, to a private school. Not my, everybody is not like my, I am very proud. <laughs> it is a privilege for me to come here, one of the premier institutions of Jammu City. 
uh, I have dealt with ETT scam and all that. I have investigated that SSC crime. I am happy to share it with that. You are not one among them. <laughs> there are many people who have been missing and looking the people, but your contribution is great. I knew Dr. Arun Gupta very well. God bless his soul. I have seen that. I was an NSS volunteer in Jammu industry for a very long time. And I could see their contribution in the feed that I did. <laughs> I need to say uh, uh, that once she sends her, her kids to school, only for her vacation or move or something like that. By the time he gets into college, or she gets into college, she's already 40 years old. And she wants to get him or her admitted in a good college. She's 45. Biological problems. By the time. She is 45 or 50. She has osteoporosis. She has arthritis. She has diabetes. Every money is spent on those things. Her husband, who is even police, is a police. As on that. Or, sorry, that she has single mothers. She has a single mother. 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 और बहुत बार तब मेरे पास छुट्टी लेकर नहीं कराती है कि सर ससुर बीमार है उसके लिए करने नहीं अभी तो बहुत अमृत काल चल रहा है जबरदस्त है कि ससुर की भी सेवा है बिकार हस्बैंड इस पुस्ते सॉरी एंड एल्स ही एक्सपेक्ट्स दैट ही शी शुड अटेंड माय पेरेंट्स आल्सो शी शुड अटेंड हर पेरेंट्स आल्सो � कार लोन है, घर का लोन है, वो भी दीवी ही ले, तो ये तो जेंडर इक्वेलिटी की बात है, जहाँ तक इंटरवेंशन का सवाल है, I will talk on that later on कि how, what we have been doing so far, the government intervention और बाकी की बात है, बात औरतों और मर्दों को बराबर लाने की नहीं है, बात सिर्फ एक एहसास की है, बाकी सब चीजें होगा हम तो अभी तक हमें वो एहसास तक नहीं है कि औरत की वैल्यू जिंदगी में क्या है ये अच्छा है कि आप माँ के गाने सुनो मेरी माँ मेरी माँ लेकिन या मेरी बात लेकिन एक्चुअली जब घर में आपके वर्कप्लेस से बाकी जगहों पे उनकी स्ट्रगल्स और जलों जहाँ देखते हो वो है मैं लॉन्ग पेटी हूँ can you share some of the you know interventions that we can help? I'll start with a very uh, something that came across the screen is that in India we have a concept of a paternity leave and maternity. Each one of us is aware of that. I don't think many uh, male employees aware that paternity because the female is there for initial six months and there's the child care leave. So the female is there to take care of their child. But recently going through some documents, I came across a, uh, there's another thing called a parental leave. It is available in certain countries, like in Korea, in Sweden, in Spain, in Portugal, it's a list of countries. The concept is to keep the father as much as involved with the child and share the responsibilities as the mother. It is not to, you know, bring him behind the doors. It is just to make him realize that he is at par with the female when it comes to the child rearing. This is not any responsibility additionally cast on him. It is just a kind of uh, creating that awareness. Now, the fact is, uh, when it comes to that parental leave, it is mandatory for the father to obey it. Now, he doesn't have a choice. He cannot choose to omit it. If it is 60 days, then it is initial 30 days for the female and 30 days for the male. Otherwise, it goes after, after 30 days. So, one is, I think, that kind of measure should also be introduced in our country, which is not there. Nevertheless, there are various measures have been taken by the government also for uh, removing this gender disparity. We all are aware of Beti Bajau, Beti Padhau. There is that Ujwala scheme, Nirvaya scheme. Then the recently introduced National, National Education, yeah, Lati Beti, National Education Policy, National Education Policy, which have just been introduced. It is also focusing upon gender disparity. Many interventions have been made. Now, when you come, when, if I am able to speak about my workplace, then, um, I think the uh, emphasis should be on uh, making fair decisions, giving representation to all these sectors equally. When I say that, that is what I mean is that uh, in certain spheres of the workplace, I may not quote them, 
certain decisions are taken favoring a particular sex, be it a female or a male. I think that is not uh, better for the progress of the workplace also in the long run because when two minds are contributing to a work or to a project, then a single mind working on it, I think we all can ascertain how the progress will be. So my solution will be this only, that we all should be, the, the emphasis should not only be on women and women-centric issues. Men should be given an equal role when it comes to bridging this gap between both the sexes. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm sure the question of racial inevitability is required. And we are sensitive to both the genders. Uh, of, I, I must say all the genders. Not only if it's not no longer a binary uh, division of gender as such. Um, on the solution side, I see that uh, women entrepreneurs are coming uh, in a big, big way. Uh, into helping into economy and India has, you know, uh, numbered or ranked as third in, in the countries where female uh, entrepreneurs are, you know, working towards national development. So my question to you, which is a man, we have been hearing about Picky Flow since morning. So how Picky Flow is helping uh, women entrepreneurs, especially in JFK? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, concerning Picky Flow, I would really want to share here that uh, Picky Flow, which is Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and Flow is the uh, winning wing of Picky. Uh, this is the biggest apex body of industry in Southeast Asia. And in India alone, we have 19 chapters and touching about 10,000 empowered women as members. So uh, I think speaking of this scale, we, we get an idea enough uh, what we really bring on the table and how we can really handhold many, many women along this journey. Now, when we talk about this whole startup ecosystem and uh, this whole entrepreneurial journey, uh, I would like to share that uh, under Fiki, we have various verticals. And startup is one of the verticals that uh, Fiki Flow has taken, which all the 19 chapters are practicing. And under this, we have a huge pool of mentors you know, they are uh, venture capitalists, they are uh, mentors who are running their own revenue generating companies, there are angel investors, and we are acting as a bridge between new startups, women based startups, and the established startups, and giving them all the expertise that Flow can offer. You know, we have a, a website also for this, uh, we have uh, trainings at different levels. Uh, you know, as Nikonam also said, it's grassroots, it's middle, it's the higher level. So it's not only the startups which are at a higher level, we are also catering and looking at startups which are right at the rural level. And you know, acting as a bridge where uh, they are not able to make inways in terms of their branding, in terms of their packaging. You know, village level will be very calm marketing. Right. Marketing is not available. So we are acting as a bridge at that level, giving them those insights, those know-how, those competencies, and uh, trying to you know bring them at the right platform where they can sell their products. Thank you so much. I think uh, women here in the hall also would be you know uh, getting this information if they want to have a startup. So I know they can definitely go for that. Yeah. Um, since our topic is about gender equality and we are connecting it to the sustainable development goals and uh, focusing on goal five. So, uh, my question is open to all the panelists: Is how is gender equality is actually helping in achieving other sustainable goals? Whether we say poverty or reduction of hunger or clean air and environment, how is women contributing or achieving gender equality is contributing towards that? Um, so, I'm going to start with you. Um, yes. Uh, women's contributions, women citizens, one third uh, total economy. But unfortunately, what has happened is when we talk of uh, women's contribution, maximum uh, contributions from for the care economy. So to that extent, we need to have a present um, government uh, needs to have a full fledged policy framework uh, where you know we can facilitate such things. Just now, ma'am was mentioning which you know how much. How much uh, it has brought relief to women who had to bring uh, wood for for this thing from remote areas, what suburbs that in the real ground realities? Because seventy percent of people in India live in rural areas, villages. We have six lakh villages. 
and people get into these villages, they uh, they don't have all these things. And, and yet, you know, when we talk of uh, availability and resources and things like that. But yes, definitely when we talk of sustainable development goals, goal number five, and we find there's an interconnection between all other goals, ultimately sustainability, contribution of women in the events. But uh, not many steps need to be taken because 70% of our what comes to our mind? Males. But do you know in agriculture sector only 70% contribution by women only? And there was a one um, that reminds me of a one uh, workshop was going on in Rajasthan. Um, I, I think it's uh, one decade back. And uh, um, the, the concerned sponsors had invited couples, all stratas. And then they asked them, okay, what, what exactly is the work we are doing, right, from morning to them? We teacher tha, kisi ne bula, ek farmer ko bhi puchha gaya, usse ka, mai to farmer hoon, bula, aap ki wife kya bula, kuch nahi karti hai. Then uski wife ko puchha gaya, aap kya karti hai, usse sir? And she said, I get up at five, I start getting very uh, pani, blue lana hai, then khana banana hai, then uh, dishwashing, and she gave her program right from 5 to evening. And the things that when we talk of multitasking, we don't have a data. Unfortunately, we are talking of responsive budgets, we are talking of policy frameworks, we are talking of reaching channels. We don't have this segregated data about. What is happening? Because gender equality ka matlab nahi hai putting men behind. Kuch areas hai men far away. But unfortunately, we have to have a gender empowerment measures. We have to have a gender empowerment measures, facilitation measures, uh, which are inbuilt. Suppose let me give you a very important uh, example. Aapne dekho ha, Asha, uh, uh, Asha scheme ke tehaan delivery banai gai incentive. The rights kya gaya 1500 rupees mein and now we see uh, I would like to share with uh, all of you here. I happen to go all the districts of um, particularly or Rajasthan, Maharashtra, Maharashtra has two strong self help books. So, 70% of the cater for the villages, women who cater for the we need to have self help books, and I was surprised. women short term goals. Unke paas awareness nahi hoti. Wo aati ki just ek dil ka khame kitna paisa milega. They were not bothered with skills and other things which we were providing them those training interventions and programs and we were giving them schemes and women development corporations things like that. But they would say man, hame kitna paisa milega ek dil ke liye. Acha, aapne kola hai paas book apna account kola. You know, fifty percent of women still don't have accounts. Economic emancipation, and all those family records just now, one of the speakers record just now, most of the women who are earning, they are not managing their funds. There was a one lady, very emancipated lady. I talked to her, I said, How do you manage your uh, salary? She said, You know, I'm very thankful to my husband. He manages everything. Uh, uh, and I'm very happy. I said, What it makes you happy? I was referring to happiness in this. The kind of happiness we have. She said, I'm not with that good. Um, pocket money, and <laughs> <laughs> I know I am very really surprised. I know I get good pocket money, good and you know, sometimes I will get tip for mother or sister, and he never stops. He's very nice. And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> and her of interventions. In, um, I'm, uh, I would like to inform, I have a Nina with Sir, have because government man. There's no dearth of schemes. There's no dearth of policies, but they all are they are for the ornamental purposes. For the ornamental purpose, I say, with due respect to the government, because whenever the female entrepreneurs ki baat kar rahe hai, sara, 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 ki hai, but you know, still you know, still you know, entrepreneur ke naam pe loan diya jata hai, and then who, who uses that money? Who uh, who takes the decision how the money is? Women are not knowing what they have to, what they have cooked together, what they have to cook and what they have to eat in the evening. So entrepreneurship, 
what checks and balances are there? As you rightly said, uh, marketing products, ke liye, baki ke liye. we have an e heart program also, government of India is hand holding. Kar rahe hai. But the question is, what is the basic awareness? Hai? So, sir, we have to go to level, se, chahe, government ki level, se, unless and until there is a political intervention. Political will. So, we have just go to the We have many flowers and we are very good in copy, cut, paste, copy, cut, paste. Without seeing what are our drama realities. And those are the challenges which we want to we have to see, let the women come forward, let the NGOs come forward, let the media play a very important role. Let the organizations like, uh, it's, it's the news to me, the chambers, um, it's going to play a very important role. But then let us see how so that the proper role uh, map is laid out. Uh, only then, otherwise, it will be a distant dream to achieve whatever has been laid down by sustainable development goals. We have already Okay. Um, uh, you rightly uh, highlighted about unfair domestic work. Uh, we have uh, reproductive uh, rights and issues. We have many such issues that have been highlighted by Goal 5. Since uh, we have a time constraint, I will not go into detail of that. Uh, I would like to uh, open the house for comments and uh, questions, if any. Just a question, just a question. Sure. Remarks, uh, yeah. So far as uh, the government international policies are concerned, although we have a lot of schemes, a lot of schemes, even we change the criminal law after Nirvaha case, uh, but you, you can see the recently what happened in one of the states, I don't know, being the government service, I don't uh, want to uh, speak, uh, I have to be politically correct. But uh, the question is, we had a very progressive scheme in the world history. We have a lot of female doctors. Do you know why? Because years back, we reserved 50% seats for girl students in medical colleges. We need schemes like that. 2009, Government of India said that there should be 33% women uh, police force, at least 33%. And you will be surprised to know in JNK, a state like Bihar has 20%, and in Jammu and Kashmir, it is just 3%. 3.33%. Just 2,000 uh, women constables, 145 non gusted officers, and just 51 uh, gusted officers. So schemes like uh, having a reservation for women in medical quality center uh, all over probably the uh, females uh, makes better. Uh, uh, yes, uh, they will. And when I said that when I quoted uh, Parveen Shakir, it is not the education. He was a Pakistan civil servant officer, the IS officer of her country. When her husband deserted her, he says that wo kahi bhi gaya, to, Chorna doesn't mean you desert uh, from marriage. Chorna ye bhi hai ki aap ghar mein maujood hai aur aap usse baat bhi nahi karte. Kabhi kabhi ignore jo hai aapki chaapurusi aur usse zyada jo hai painful hai. Mein hi is pada se keh raho agar aap woman cell Gandhi Nagar mein jayenge. So, बहुत सारी लड़कियों का वहां पे काउंसलिंग होती है डायरेक्टली एफआईआर में लगाया जाता है एट द एंड ऑफ द डे वहां पे भी हम कहते हैं कि चलो यार ये भी करेगा क्योंकि लड़का जो होता है पहले ही कम लानते हैं कम नहीं थी पैट्रियार्कल सोसाइटी है मतलब लड़की वालों को लड़के वालों को ये भी एक्सपेक्टेशन है कि अगर वो कुछ नहीं करता तो लड़के वाले उसको बिजनेस में भी स्टैब्लिश कर उसको भी पैसा दे और फिर उसके बाद आज की डेट पे नशे की बहुत बड़ी लालच है और कौन उसको मुकरा सब जानते हैं कि अगर वंचर से तो सोसाइटी आउटसाइड एवरी एजुकेशन इंस्टीट्यूशन और वो है व्हाट्सएप उससे बड़ी लालच फेसबुक उससे बड़ी लालच है नॉट एक्सटेंड द थिंग बट दिस इज दिस इज रियूनिंग द फैमिली दिस इज एक्चुअली आई एम सेइंग आई विल नॉट कोट द बट दिस इज एक्चुअली हैपन बट देन उसको चलो यार छोड़ दो और लड़का है वो है ये है so my request uh, would be that if we start within ourselves, हम अपने घर से एहसास शुरू करें तो बाकी तो प्रधानमंत्री मुख्यमंत्री ये सब लोग तो स्कीम बनाते हैं लेकिन स्कीम को 
इम्प्लीमेंट करने के लिए जब तक आप पे वो करेक्टर नहीं आएगा जब तक आप पे वो जज्बा नहीं आएगा वो सब आप जैसे कहा कि कोई कस्से की तरह है at the end of the day i make 101 compromises to talk on the stock box every day i make 101 compromises so we have a very long distance to what <laughs> <laughs> we want to what we to say because what madam said ultimately kehna aasan hai lekin actual way is to change karna it's going to take a lot of time thank you very much thank you madam sorry moderator पुलिस वालों की आदत होती है यू शुड नॉट फील दिस डॉक्टर इकबाल एंड ब्यूटीफुली आई एम जस्ट कम अप विद दैट ऑफ दैट वजूद जन से है तस्वीर कायनात बयान है इसी के साथ से जिंदगी में सोते तो बताया दैट इन द ग्रैंड यूनिवर्स वुमन एट सदर टू दिस यूनिवर्स एंड इन द ग्रैंड ऑर्केस्ट्रा ऑफ लाइफ इज द लीडिंग इंस्ट्रूमेंट कोई माने या ना माने You are the green. Better be to see as said. कुछ लोगों को जल्द समझ आती है, कुछ को बाद में समझ आती है, लेकिन समझाइए. Thank you. I think sir has uh, wonderfully, you know, well enough read what we have been talking about. We can take one comment and then uh, I think share some of the takeaways from this session. So any comment? Um, we'll not go for questions. Yes. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Swati. Okay, so thank you all of you. You shared very uh, good points how the family change and what we can do as a society. Uh, however, I just have one question in my mind, and it's not a today's question. It's uh, since I was four or five, I started thinking. That uh, I'm a girl and somebody's a boy. Uh, nobody is able to explain this to me, nor my father, nor mother, nor anybody else. Uh, in fact, uh, during my college days, uh, there was a special day, and I was asked a question. I was one of the nominees for Miss Fletcher. I didn't get that uh, because my question was: if I would become a prime minister or uh, some somebody did, what would I do to bring equality? Mm -hmm. My answer was a um, little different and off the line track, and that is the same thing I wanted to ask you people. Uh, what can we do for that? Because I think uh, we can be equal. We can fight for it. We can do interventions. We can do changes. But what? Uh, we are not made similar. Actually, me and my brother are not made similar. God has not created us similarly. So what about that? Oh, can I can I take the sure, sure. Thank you, Swati, for bringing this up. But I think it's high time we celebrate our differences. It's it's so, not about physically who we are. Uh, you know, uh, I see a tectonic shift in the way organizations are working nowadays. You know, earlier big companies which were competitions to each other, like you say, male and female, are now collaborating with each other. So they have realized the importance of collaborating and uh, you know relying on each other. And I think our biggest teacher should be nature. You know, nature has made us in a certain way, and we need to respect that. We need to respect supporting each other. Even if you see that one race will be more predominant in nature, the whole uh, ecosystem will go for a toss. Yes. You know, so that support. Uh, is inevitable. We need to learn from nature and time and time we have seen that when we do not do that, nature shows us our place. You know, they will, it will show us our place sooner or later. And I just want to end by saying that, you know, this equality or an egalitarian society is, is not desirable now. It is inevitable. If human race has to survive, women will be an equal force. And there is no two ways about it. But we have to change nature. I will add nature. Hello, hello. I just like right here. I think uh, it's just a simple physical difference between a man and a woman, and it is nothing more than a biological difference. Is that? And we should celebrate women more. We should, you know, enjoy it. 
and uh, you know we uh, the celebrate our womenhood i would say so even men can have their distinct it's just a biological difference but coming to mental emotional they are as strong or as the same much stronger maybe so i think it's just a biological difference and that ends here that's my i just want to try to add to that we were creating as she's writing one we were creating dissimilar but we were not creating unequal Yeah, I mean, it was just similar that it was. It's not. I mean, it's not aiming at our equality. So we are equal in every sense of the term. That is what I would like to add. <laughs> in in fact, nature and what we have achieved is we don't have achieved nature. We have achieved the nurture. This is a there's a difference between nature and nurture. Um. Thank, thank you all the panelists for your candid sharing about the gender equality and the journey and the struggles and what we've been doing and what needs to be changed. Um, the takeaways are, you know, the, there has to be equal representation. We need to change the mindset. Um, as we said that uh, we need to actually, you know, have them implemented in the society so that we can, we should not be sitting here and talking about gender equality. We actually have gender equality. And uh, we can achieve that by so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, panelists and the moderator, for a very interactive and meaningful deliberation on the theme. Now I request uh, Dr. Adil Gupta and uh, Mrs. Rupa Gupta to kindly uh, give a token of appreciation and respect to the panelists uh, through the certificates that we have specially prepared for the panelists. So please. So please come on the stage, ma'am. Please. Miss Neha Bakshi. Mr. Mubasir Latifi. My name is mightly tongue whisper. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Mrs. Ruchika Gupta, thank you so much, ma'am. Professor Sunita Zalpuri, thank you so much, ma'am. Give a big round of applause. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. A big thank you to all the panelists for expressing their views so nicely and comprehensively that they have really enlightened uh, our students, the faculty, and of course the guests present here. A very fruitful discussion. And of course, at the end of the discussion, we all are feeling very empowered on the Women's Day. <laughs> So, uh, Thank you, next, moving on to the third session of today's okay. seminar. Okay. Yeah, I know. Should I start talking? Should I start? Achieve, achieving gender equality requires the engagement of women and men, girls and boys. It is everyone's responsibility, as said by Ban Ki moon, who was the former Secretary General of United Nations. Moving on to the third session of the seminar. 
The theme is Achieving Gender Equality for Transformative uh, Change by 2030. We have Dr. Pushpa Singh, Associate Professor, Department of Political Science, Miranda House, University of Delhi, connected with us through virtual mode to give her keynote address on the theme, Achieving Gender Equality, Prospects and Challenges. Dr. Pushpa Singh works at the Department of Political Science. She has her PhD and in agroecology and gender. Her area of interest are sociology of science, technology and environmental politics, political theory and comparative politics. Dr. Singh has contributed to many reference volumes pub published from Springer Nature, Thomson Reuters, World Scientific, Academic Press, Elsevier, Orient Baxman, Pearson, and many more. I welcome you to express your thoughts regarding the theme, ma'am, please. Thank you so much for this generous introduction. Can I request uh, Rajanji to share my PPT, please? Sure, no problem. It is actually a daunting task to speak right at the lunch session, but nonetheless, I'll take this risk. Okay. Can I begin? Yes, yes ma'am, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to begin by thanking Dr. Adit Gupta, Director and Principal, Meyer College, Dr. Renu Gupta, Chairperson, Meyer College, Dr. Bharti Tandon, Convener, Center for Women's Studies, Ms. Nandini Puri, and all faculty members for giving me this opportunity to connect with this wonderful Institute of Education and Research. I feel privileged to be part of this program that has seen guest speakers who are all great women achievers of their field. Modern Institute of Education and Research is an eminent institute serving the cause of education very well. As evident from the systematic and very organized dealing of Chair Dr. Renu Gupta and Dr. Bharti Tandon with me while scheduling this program. Also one of the young faculty member, Ms. Nandini Puri has been my student in Miranda House from 2013 to 2016. She was also the rank holder of her batch and she has been an absolute delight in the class. When you have such wonderful faculty members, the Institute is bound to achieve further eminence and accolades. My topic for address is achieving gender equality prospects and challenges. The course of discussion for this webinar will be divided into three sections. In order to analyze gender equality, it is important to first understand the issue of gender discrimination, which will be discussed in the first section. To fight gender discrimination and achieve gender equality, there is need to look at the problem in a historical perspective. Hence, the second section will highlight how the, gender, how the question of gender equality has been addressed by different feminist approaches or perspectives. In the last part, the discussion will link the theoretical to the applied part and will highlight the requirement of a multi-pronged strategy to achieve gender just world in sync with goal five of Sustainable Development Goal 2030. The discussion will be pitched at a very basic level, keeping the multidisciplinary students in mind. So let's start with the basic fact. Why it is it extremely important to engage with the understanding of gender? and how it works in patriarchal societies resulting in discrimination, oppression, and even exploitation of women, and why we should talk about gender discrimination at all, and gender justice. The answer is that if 50% of the population is subordinated and marginalized, the society cannot be just and democratic as women constitute half of the population. So as you can see in the first slide, which begins with the foundational question, what is gender? As you already have been listening to the other panelists uh, in the day, in the morning session, 
that, and you all know that there's a basic difference between gender and sex. And when we talk about gender, it is always with reference to sex. So sex refers to the set of biological attributes usually categorized as female or male. The difference between two sexes and implies that men and women will be different in some respect. For example, anatomy. On the other hand, gender refers to the socially constructed roles, behavior, expressions, and identities of girls, women, boys, and men, and also the gender diverse people. Gender is a social construction. The social and cultural norms that women are assigned with are a result of this biological determinism and essentialism that identify women and men with, a, with certain essential nature. The biological function of reproduction of women has come to characterize her rest of the roles and responsibilities in family and the society. The reproductive and the care ethics of bearing and rearing of children has been projected as the essence of women's life. Such constructions of gender stereotypes create hierarchy with men at the top and women at the bottom. Some examples of gender constructions are the norms of society that define what girls and boys should wear, how they should behave. The society defines gender appropriate behaviors, which is tied to the concept of male and female sexuality. For example, women are associated with traits of being caring, nurturing and emotional, whereas men are associated with reason and objectivity. Similarly, whereas women are generally associated with beauty, cooking, cleaning, Men are associated with works which involve tools, vehicles, and machines. Some colors are identified with girls while others with boys, like pink for girls and blue for boys. Dolls are seen as ideal toys for girls and car for boys. Likewise, some professions are seen as appropriate for women. Feminization of professions like teaching, nursing, is due to the reason that these works are seen as extension of nurturing work. Feminist scholars have challenged these perceived natural differences between men and women, which are actually not natural. And they are all product of history. Gender perception influences how people perceive themselves and also each other, how they act and interact, and the distribution of power and resources in the society. However, it is important to emphasize here that gender identity is not confined to a binary. That means always looking in terms of women versus man, nor is it static. It exists along a continuum and can change over time. There is considerable diversity in how individuals and groups understand, experience and express gender through the roles they take on, the expectation which is placed on them, relations with each other and the complex ways that gender is institutionalized in a society. These ideas about gender and gender-defined roles of men and women shape and govern our world. It leads to a patriarchal world that is governed by men and women just follow along. A patriarchal society is based on the centrality of men, father or the eldest, eldest male member, seen as the head of the family. Patriarchy is a hierarchical social order identified with primacy of men and women are placed in the secondary status. This hierarchy also results in men being in the position of power, with the private sphere, within the private sphere, or the public sphere. Men happen to own and control property, resources, and opportunities that help them sustain their dominance, whereas women are excluded and marginalized. I can give one of the examples which comes from my own personal experience while doing my doctoral research. When I was traveling through different states <clears throat> while I was working on the seed saving practices, so the, in, in the states of Himachal Pradesh, Odisha, Tamil Nadu, I interacted with a range of women farmers. And uh, I found that, you know, all these women farmers were actually in, in the control of seed. They were the seed curators, not only seeds, but also in terms of practices of multiple cropping, intercropping. It, every time it was women deciding and about these and operationalize which crops to be cultivated together. Along with that, they play critical roles in managing the biodiversity and the local resource management. But despite all this, women are never seen as farmers. This point was also raised by the other panelists just before my, my session. In fact, this was uh, the greatest concern from all the women farmers while I was interviewing them, that they all said that they are never recognized as farmer. Why? Because farmer is always thought to be a man. So 
women uh, respondents also said that, you know, they are always, most of the time, they are deprived from all the facilities and the policies that are there for the farmers. Because most of these policies are always pegged with the land entitlement. And we all know that land ownership in India, as like in for most of the South Asia, it is always in, in the name of May. All this arrangement is neither democratic nor just, and hence needs to be restructured to make society democratic. One of the ways to address this problem is by creating awareness about the construction of gender and how it shapes our world. Therefore, gender sensitization is very crucial, as it would help us to modify our behavior by raising concerns of gender equality. Various institutions and working places organize sensitization programs with the name of changing behavior in the manner which is sensitive to gender equality issues. It helps us in examining our personal beliefs and views that may be gender biased and reform it, reform it to treat women at par with men in all realms of life. So from here, we go to the next slide, which is on gender discrimination. How do we understand and what is gender discrimination? So this gender discrimination is actually an impact and an effect of social process of gender relations that institutionalize and reproduce certain norms of genders to privilege one gender, which is men, and marginalize and exclude or oppress the other gender, which is women. <clears throat> Though I'm referring in terms of binary, which is women and men, but this discussion is aware and mindful of un unsettled gender norms as gender and sexuality is like a spectrum. And different groups may like to identify themselves with, this, with any part of the spectrum. However, what is interesting is that apart from men, rest all categories, including women, transgender, and other face severe discriminations. Gender norms are codified in every culture and society, and transgressing gender norms result in extreme abuses and violence. Women face disparities in access to and control over services, opportunities, and resources. These disparities are reflected in indicators of health, nutrition, literacy, education attainment, skill level, occupational status, among others. The poor status and value attached to women is also reflected in the fact that female ratio, sex ratio is declining. From an already low 945 in 1991 to 927 in 2001, implying that million of girls went missing in just a decade. There are a number of gender-specific barriers which prevent women and girls from gaining access to their rightful share. As you can see in the on the slide, the first picture, which is actually a uh, trying to replicate a classroom scenario where the teacher says that of course you know women and men are equal or the girls and boys are equal. But what is important to be noticed here is that if you look at the the textbook, the pictorial depiction is what the students are looking at the image where women is standing besides the stove or the hood. And while the man is just carrying a suitcase and waving and he's just going outside. Now, this is trying to capture and trying to send a message that, you know, uh, if we just keep on paying the lip service by saying that, okay, there has to be gender parity. But what is actually being uh, practiced in explicit or maybe tacit ways through different mediums, including that of, you know, pictorial depictions in the textbook, this is not going to simply work. And also, if you look at, pay attention to the next picture, which is just below the first picture, what we see here is that, that the boss is saying to the new recruit, who happens to be a lady, that, oh, good that you have joined, that, oh, we all want to have more women in the offices. So now that we, I don't have to make my own uh, coffee. So imagine this is the kind of sexism that uh, that is pregnant, that of course women are allowed, but then they will be always assigned a certain specific type of stereotype. And this is how gender stereotypes pervade everywhere. And this kind, this, this is the kind of attitude that's need to be changed. So in order to resist this kind of gender discrimination, which, which is prevalent and in, in you know, uh, not just in the public life, but private life also, we all have been discussing this since the morning. So in order to resist gender discrimination and patriarchy, there has been women's movement. We all know about that. And these women's movement has unfolded in, in form of different waves and approaches. So there are different strands of feminism that offer different perspectives on gender equality. They differ in terms of their explanation of cause and remedies of gender injustices. So let's look at them, that how do they approach the question of gender equality? So the very first school of thought in feminism as seen 
and also which has been product of first wave of feminism has been the liberal feminism. Liberal feminism primarily employed the framework of rights, mainly political and civil rights. We all know about the suffrage movement and they all demanded gender justice. Applying the logistics of enlightenment and inspired by French revolution, liberal feminist scholars stressed upon the idea of equality of men and women. The philosophy of individualism and rationalism enabled them to project women as independent and we all know that Mary Wollstonecraft, who wrote a vindication of rights of women in 1792, laid the foundation of liberal feminism. Implying similar lines of argument used by philosophers of enlightenment, Wollstonecraft produced the first systematic account of women's rights and freedom. She questioned the exclusion of women from the citizenship rights and fiercely advocated similar equal rights for men and women both. The problem with liberal feminism is that their reformist approach that did not delve deep into questioning the patriarchal order, economic exclusions, and hence we have another school of thought in form of socialist feminism. One of the earliest work in socialist feminism has been the publication of both the origin of family, property, and state in 1884, which was written by no one else but Frederick Angels. So Angels elaborates on how physical and sexual labor of women has been appropriated for reproductive and caretaking functions of private property and the family. From then onwards, all societies have been made patrilineal property flowing from fathers to son. The subordination and suppression of women, which is not natural, but made to appear so in order to cater to patriarchy. Socialist feminists like Alison Jagger, Maria Mies, Gerda Lerner applied Marxist categories like labor and economic structures to address the question of gender inequality. Patriarchy that jointly subordinates women. They find economic dependence of women on men as the main cause of their subordination. Consequently, they call for social and economic equality and financial independence of women. For them, motherhood and bondage of domesticity is, a li is liable for women's survival status. However, the problem with socialist feminism was that it suffered from economic determinism. We, we also know that and some other for as some other important categories that sustain patriarchy and women's discrimination and subordination has been absent from their uh, analysis. And that's why we also have another school of thought, which is a very powerful approach, which emerged in 1960s and called by the name of radical feminism. It developed profound critique of patriarchy by analyzing power differential and sexuality. They found that power relations and sexuality as the main cause of women's subordination and discrimination and also see family as the site of women's subordination. Kate Millett in her book, Sexual Politics Explores, the role of patriarchal violence, dominance, and power in holding sexual relation. She sees politics not as innocent, but as mediated by power relations and hierarchy that operates everywhere. By implying examples from different religion, Millett shows that how it plays a prominent role in establishing and sustaining the hegemony of male and inferiority of the female. In Dialectics of Sex, Shulamit Firestone in 1972 traces the biological root of patriarchy in reproduction and child rearing. Similarly, Germaine Greer, the female eunuch, written in 1970, pressed the idea that the burden of domesticity and nuclear family deprived them from their capacity to action. Women are made to cater to the needs and desires of men's world by separating themselves from their sexuality, natural and political autonomy. We also have psychoanalytical feminism that offers the psychological analysis of women's subordination and patriarchy. Prominent of them are Juliet Mitchell, who in her work, Psychoanalysis and Feminism, written in 19. 1974 depicts Freud's analysis of masculinity and femininity as the construct of patriarchal culture. Similarly, Nancy Cordero in her book, The Reproduction of Mothering, written in 1978, finds exclusive female mothering responsible for gender role and inferior inferiority of women. One important aspect of psychological, psychoanalytical feminism is the ethics of care debate. All of us, we know that. This debate happened between Carol Gilligan and Lawrence Kohlberg. Gilligan challenged the Freudian notion that men have a well-developed sense of justice and morality, whereas women do not. She emphasized that the socialization process within the family and society 
inculcates different methods of moral thinking in men and women. Whereas women generally display orientation for care, men follow the orientation for justice. This in no sense proves that men's conceptualization and understanding is better. It only means that men and women relate to world and their fellow beings differently. Expanding to this rich uh, debate in feminism about the approaches, we also have black feminism, which actually emphasizes intersectionality of racism and sexism in oppression. Black feminists like Alice Walker, Bell Hope states that women of color experience different forms and degrees of oppression because of their racial identity. They question the universality of feminist movement and believe that women of color face a different kind of oppression compared to white women. And then we have postmodern feminists who question the essentialism and determinism of gender itself. They also raise questions about the projected universal truths about difference between men and women. They focus on subjective experiences and diversity of lived experience. Helen Sixers, Luce, Eric Ray, Judith Butler, all of them, they talk about all these issues. And then we also have ecofeminists joining the debate. We have Carolyn Merchant and Vanna Shiva, who holds that qualities and capabilities harbored by women, like creation, nurturance, sustenance, and rootedness, make them different and maybe better than men. In that sense, ecofeminists celebrate the feminine difference, which, which is derided by patriarchy. Post feminists defies the ideas of second wave feminism or radical feminism. Feminists like Camille Paglia and Natasha Walter stress that women should celebrate their sexuality, projecting themselves not as victims but as, as Asians. So we have seen that there is a very rich historical debate which is available in a historical manner to us. So this is about theoretically contextualizing. Now that we have already theoretically contextualized the problem and see how all of them aim at achieving gender parity, let us now proceed to de deliberate on the ways and means to achieve gender equality as it is envisioned by Sustainable Development Goals 2030. As we all know that there are 17 Sustainable Development Goals as declared by United Nations, and entire world has agreed to achieve these goals. Among all these goals, goal number five of SDG is gender equality and empowering women and girls. And we are concerned here about this particular goal, which is goal number five. SDG five covers all dimensions of gender equality, including economic, social, and political. In order to achieve these, there are several targets that have been set. Like we have target five, Point one that aims at ending all forms of discrimination against all women and girl child everywhere. This target looks at four parameters, including public life, violence against women, employment and economic benefit, marriage and family. It analyzes if legal parameters are available in all the countries to ensure if these are if, if these are to be achieved. Target five point two aims at elimination of all forms of violence, which is which may be physical, sexual, or mental violence against women and girls. Target 5.3 eliminate aims at eliminating all harms, harmful practices such as child marriages, forced marriages, and female genital mutilation. Target 5.4 aims at recognizing the value and valuing unpaid work. As we already know about the domestic labor debate, and this has been going on globally in all different countries that how this can be, how the women's work can be recognized. Target 5.5 looks at the political leadership and decision-making at national as well as global level. And target 5.6 aims at universal access to sexual and reproductive health. So these are the targets that have been set in order to achieve the goal five of SDG. But also let's have the reality check now so, you know, as we have been seeing, this is the set standard, but what is the reality? You know, the average percentage women in the national parliament is still 25.6%, and at the local level, it is 36.3%. If we talk about India, then our country is standing at 108th position out of 144 countries in the gender gap index, which is a vast gap. The female sex ratio is 940 according to 2011 census. 
21% of children are still getting married before the legal age. In the labor market, labor market, women still get 30% less wage compared to men. Women mortality rate remains still very high. And while those who manage to survive suffer generations of malnutrition. So what can be done? The answer lies in a consolidated or multi-pronged approach that works at several levels. And these levels, as you can see on the slide, these levels are individual, interpersonal, then community, state, as well as global. All these levels have to be coordinated and <clears throat> collaborated so that all these functions, all these achievements can be, all these works can be achieved. At the state and administrative level, the constitutional guarantees of equal rights and liberties must be substantively experienced by women. Targeted policies for gender empowerment in different sectors of society should be worked out. At international level, gender mapping of global institutions and bodies should be done. Along with all these, creating awareness by sensitization programs like the one we are having right now is very important. Certain institutional mechanisms like gender mainstreaming, gender budgeting are significant to mention. As we all know that despite the constitutional assurance of rights and liberties, the status of women is still far from equal in the society. Hence, the need of proactive mechanisms like gender mainstreaming that can be done by gender budgeting. Gender budgeting means preparing budgets and scrutinizing them from a gender perspective and highlighting the gender differential impact. It is a strategy to achieve equality between women and men by focusing on how public resources are collected and how they are spent. As my conclusive remark, I would add that gender equality must be our top priority as it would strengthen sustainable and inclusive development of our nation. Over the past two decades, women's, in, women's empowerment has been increasingly recognized as crucial factor for the country's holistic and sustainable development. Several programs and projects across the world has been launched and are currently in progress to, to bring social, economic and political equity and broader access to basic livelihood needs. Our democracy will be democracy in true sense when it also when it is also gender just. By saying that, I address my case here, but I'll, I'll be very happy to take questions and engage with the audience here. Thank you so much. Any questions or queries from the audience? <laughs> yes, yes. Anybody would like to ask something? To the resource person? No? Okay. So I think people are too hungry, too hungry. And I'm standing between the lunch and the... No, no, no. There's nothing like that, ma'am. Actually, they have been listening to this theme uh, since morning. And probably you have explained it so well that they have been enlightened regarding all the important aspects of uh, your topic. And so elaborately, you presented it through the presentation. So, ma'am, uh, we are highly thankful to you for enlightening us with our uh, informative uh, thoughts. Uh, and uh, thank you for sparing your valuable time, although you had connected long back, but somehow it got little uh, delayed. We are sorry for that. Uh, now I request Dr. Bindu Dua, Assistant Professor, PG Department, Meyer College of Education, to ma'am kindly present the formal vote of thanks. Good afternoon, one and all. Thank you is such a prayer that cannot be seen or touched. It must be felt by heart. I feel honored and privileged to get the opportunity to propose a vote of thank on this auspicious occasion of the seminar. I would like to uh, thank all the honorable delegates who have successfully uh, made this program and for their benign presence. I am especially uh, thankful uh, to Dr. Pushpa Singh, Associate Professor, Department of Political Science, Miranda House, for accepting our invitation and being a part of the seminar. I'm also thankful to the Chairperson Meyer Group 
of institutions for uh, Mrs. Uh, Renu Gupta for supporting us in all possible manner to organize the seminar. My special thanks to Professor Adit Gupta, Principal and Director, Maya College of Education, for constant help and guidance that radiated a source of energy with us. At this juncture, I would like to thank Mrs. Rupa Gupta, the Joint Director Meyer, for help and support at various stages. I'm also thankful to Mrs. Ruchika Gupta and also thankful to HODs of UG and PG department and will all uh, be grateful to them. I'm thankful to deputy heads, PG and UG department. I'm also thankful to the IT staff for, cap for uh, motivating the team and working it efficiently. I am thankful to the photographic section for capturing the movements and making it a memory. Thank you one and all. I'm going to go to the next one.